Are we on? Yes, Testing sir. one, two. Testing one, two. Are we on? Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I am your host, Glenn Pooh Harding. And tonight, we have a very special guest. This basketball head is a Midwood High School and Brooklyn legend. He was honorable mention All-American. Oh, yeah, we're going into all of that. So this is all. For those of you that don't know, we talking about Street and Smith honorable mention All American. If you was in Street and Smith, man, that was everything. That was like the Source magazine for basketball. You know, the Source magazine for hip hop. Well, Street and Smith was that to basketball. So if you was mentioned in there, like myself and my next guest. You was already on par to be one of the best of the country. He was in Street and Smith from the years of 1975, 1976, and 1977. Man, 1977, who could forget? That was the year of the New York City blackout. You had to be around to know what that was like. He was also the logo for the Brevo Sports Foundation magazine. I didn't even know that. <laughs> I saw the magazine. I saw the dunk, I put it all together, I was like, man, definitely a legend. Who also knew that he was Rucker Park High School MVP in 1975 and 1976. This basketball head would also win first place in the Riverside Hawks BCI National Champs. I gotta ask him, was that AAU? Well, we're gonna find out later. After high school, he received a scholarship to attend Long Island University, where he was captain from 1979 to 1982 and helped lead the Blackbirds to a 1981 NCAA tournament berth and also an NIT berth in 1982. Once his college career was over, he became the director and founder of the Elite 75 Prep Showcase Camps in Charlotte, North Carolina, while also head of player development for Nike EYBL Team United. Now, he's retired from the game, but is joining it from afar. So, without further ado, help me welcome to the show, Midwood High School and Brooklyn legend, Long Island University great, Eric Short. How you doing, bro? What's happening? What's happening, my brother? Oh, no, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Good. All right, let me just tell the people in the audience, if you're watching us, join us at YouTube right now. If you're coming in the room, go to YouTube. You know how we do. I'm live right now. So make sure y'all go and join us on YouTube. All right? Salute to everybody in the room. Come over and join us. Come join us. So good over in YouTube. All right. So we're just going to give a few more minutes. Like one more minute so people could join us in the room. We are on YouTube Live right now. Oh, let me let me get this playing. Wow. And I actually could play us live while we but I'm not gonna do that because I can give them something else to watch. Here we go. Yeah, so we 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 definitely want to um, make sure um, that the park is up to par. I know we talked about it before we went on a broadcast about Brevoort and the conditions. Those conditions was like that for like thirty something years. Right. And. Uh, the company who I'm on their board of trustees now, Full Court Peace, uh, we hooked up last year and they came through and they retarded the whole thing and painted it over. And it was absolutely marvelous because, hold on, let me see if it's, I'm going to show you a picture real quick so you can check it out. And then we'll get to rolling. So I don't know if you can see it, right? 
Right, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now see, nice. Like, that's nice. <laughs> that's that's how it's gonna look. Yeah, that's, that's how nice. it's gonna look. Yeah, that's nice. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> Salute to my people's our full core piece. What up, Mike? So that's 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 the goal, and we want to keep that tradition um, of Brevo basketball going because, as you know, it is the rucker of Brooklyn. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So um, let's let's get this over here. So there you go. Cool. Now I feel a little bit better. All right. So I want to jump right into this. You know, um, this is long overdue, um, and people have no idea. I have so many guests to get to, and the line just keeps growing and growing. And, and I want to thank everybody out there for for their support and been helping us grow uh, these last, you know, two years, because we've only been doing this two years, and this is our 200 and, I think, 33rd show. Wow. Mm. Tonight. So, welcome to the show, Mr. Short. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good, man. I appreciate you having me, man. I really do, you know? You know your, your story definitely needs to be told in so many ways. I know you, you first started out uh, with Coach Booth on the Ballside Middle documentary, which I was very amazed at and learned a lot of things that I didn't know uh, about Brooklyn basketball, especially, you know, during your time in your era. And, and, and just motivates me more to want to get these stories out. Yeah, and there's a lot of them, you know. I mean, it's um, that the project of Boston Side Middle with Craig has been um, an eye-opening experience for us all because we've all had an opportunity to see what the history of the game was like back then. And... Um, and there's more to tell. There's so much to tell that you really can't get to it all, you know. But um, right now, I think that, um, you know, we got it started and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good concept and it looks well. It looks real good, you know. Yeah, man. That's 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 awesome. Well, before we start the show, I got to give a shout out to my guy Dexter over at M1. And my guy, you know, Shane the Dribble Machine for inviting me down to the <laughs> event. And blessing me with all these kicks, man. You see these joints? <laughs> these, these is nice, man. These is nice. Yo, good looking out. Oh, we not finished yet. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Um, Salute to N1. Uh, Salute to N1. Y'all doing it up big. Y'all back in business. Doing that thing. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So I want to salute N1. Appreciate the love. So, I want to jump right into this. Um, who introduced you to the game? Wow. Um, gosh, it had to have been... Um, actually, the, the truth be told is one of my best friends, Les Miller. Um, Leslie Miller and I grew up together on Rutland Road in Flappish area, which is halfway between Church Avenue and Empire. Mm. And, um, and Les, you know, we were best friends. Our parents were friends, and we started, you know playing, you know, in the, you know, PS 92 and the, you know, at, you know, at lunchtime and after school and going to Wingate. And that jump started me to want to play the game because he was playing for a team called St. Francis of Sissy, which mm. is like a uh, notion Avenue and uh, Maple. Yeah. And, um, and the coach lived around the corner from us. So he said, Eric, come and play. And I was like, you know, yeah, I've never played organized basketball before, you know, and um, first game I ever played in PS 92, Let's jump ball, got the but you know, tapped it to me right away. I caught the ball and threw it like a baseball at the backboard, man. Hit the backboard real hard, you know. And and and, and but after that, you know, things calmed down. But um, I had no concept, you know, so but I was still excited to want to play the game. So, you know, you started looking for more info, you know, as things progressed. And, um, and that was the beginning. And it was like, you know, it must have been like around, you know, fourth, fourth, third, fourth grade, you know. But, um, but all hell broke loose after that, man. I just started playing more, playing in the parks and um, following suit with the people that were in that community, which were guys like George Berry, um, Alan Thompson that played with um, Bill Cartwright at San Francisco, um, you know, the, the Erasmus contingent of guys, Derek Rucker, may rest in peace. Right. My, my brother, another brother named Stephen Porter, 
that was a great play that passed away. Um, you know, so I've watched these guys play and it made me want to play more and more and more. And, um, and that's, that's, that's the beginning. That is the exact beginning. And, um, you know, you, you worked hard at it. You worked real hard, but as time went on, you know, and you learn and then you started performing, you know, then it became what it is. But, right. um, but the beginning, uh, I, I give all of that to my boy, Les Miller, man. I'm, you know, he got me into it and, and we, and we still best friends to this day, you know, and, um, yeah, that, that it was those some great times, man, for Listen, real. Those, those times, you know, when we talk about, you know, our first game under the referee and the jitters and the excitement of, of being out in the court. Um, I think a lot of us shared that moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. And it's, and it's hard to get through to, who, who, who was naturals, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to get through because, you know, you're, you're, you're playing so poorly that you don't know where you're going to be at five, six years later. Right. But, you know, one, you know, but one season under your belt, now you're a vet, you know, then after that, you know, you're playing and, and plus I'm getting bigger, you know, so, you know, come eighth grade, I'm six, four. Didn't know where it came from, but I've been this height since I've, since 13 years old. And um and and then then everything became you know a success story because I started getting around the people that were good players, you know at that age and messing around with George Murden from Restoration Corporation and Gil Reynolds, and those two guys gave me everything I needed, you know. Listen, let let's 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 pause for a minute to you know uh, show some love to those two gentlemen, you know. Um, I'm very familiar with Gil Reynolds because uh, if it wasn't for him giving me those fundamentals early, I don't think I'd had a chance of making Lincoln as a freshman. Now, even with the skills I had, I didn't think I was going to be able to make it. Um, but I definitely uh, credit to Coach Gil Reynolds, may he rest in peace, for the, the foundation of the game. Because yeah. we would go up to 309 Park because we wanted to stay out of trouble. And we heard about uh, Gil holding workouts and stuff, and we would go up there and just learn the game. And yeah, he meant yeah. so much to me in my development, man. So I definitely want to give a shout out. Yeah, to he, he, they, the they the did people. something to every single one of us that you can't put it on paper, but it's just a feeling of confidence because you know you were learning right and correct information, you know. And my, my first time I ever left New York City. Was the was I was 13 years old, went to Detroit with Gil and George. Mm. And it was like Bernard King, Albert King, you know, uh, I mean, it was like so many players. Uh, Craig Smoke, uh, Russell Saunders, Dennis West, Dwayne Cotton. And, and I was 13, and me and Albert King were the 13-year-olds. Everybody else was already in high school. We were still in wow. junior high school. And it was up there at St. Cecilia-ville in Detroit where Dick Vitale ran it. And because he was a coach at University of Detroit. Yeah. So we went out there and I'm telling you, Pooh, I'm telling you, God's on his truth. We're there for about seven days. And I must have played total game time play, maybe three minutes. Mm. But I practice every day, every day we practice. And I was practicing with Bernard King and all the guys I mentioned. And at 13 years old, and me and Albert, but Albert had been established, known, people loved him. So he got a lot of perks, whereas I was like a newbie and I was just running around like a you know, chicken with his head cut off, you know. And, but the guys, Russell Saunders, Renee Stevens, may he rest in peace. Uh, Marshall Williams from Lane, rest in peace. All those guys, James Hayes from Lane, all those guys kind of like mentored me and took care of me, you know, so that but I was learning and I was like, why eyes wide open, listening to George Merton, listening to Gil, all the stuff that they said and, and just following suit, whatever, whatever Albert and Bernard or, or the best players did, I copied it and imitated it. So I started becoming, you know, um, comfortable with doing the things that a good player would do. And, and you know, when you go to camp away from the city and when you come back, you know how good you are after. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so, and I was going right into high school, so everything was like uphill battle from there. 
you know, and it was like, and I was just grabbing stuff and getting better and better, you know, until, you know, high school, you know, season started. And, um, and then that's another story, you know, but the well, beginning. So we, we definitely going to tap into there, but, you know, just, just knowing uh, the different uh, experiences that we had going to basketball camp, these kids don't experience those things because they jump right into AAU. Right. Yeah. They don't realize why they're not getting better because they're just playing games and not really working on their games. That's right. You know, and that's like that's like going into a math test and taking the test right away without studying, without getting the information. There's a process in place. You study, then you then the game time. You 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 work on what you did. And when you eliminate part of that regiment, you, you play the same now. You have no critiquing of yourself. As an athlete, you should be critiquing yourself to say, gosh, I miss. My, what's up with my form? Why is my elbow out? Maybe I need to fix this. Maybe I'm losing the ball too much when I'm handling it. I need to bend down. I mean, these are the things that no one pays attention to anymore because everything is, is kind of like um, a taser. You know, like a big excitement right away, but there's nothing right, in right. between, you know, and you can't have the dessert before you have the main course, you know, and it's and, and that's the process. But now, you know, it's kind of tainted because, like you said, no one goes to camps anymore. And if you're real good, you go to secluded camps with like players like you, like from the sneaker companies. But the local stuff, there's no camps. There's no. And so hence, there's no teaching. No. No, they got that. Listen, and I think that's that's all part of the plan uh, because you, you you jump these kids into the AAU scene, but the sneaker companies are in charge, right? So it's basically product placement, right? Right, with the guys with the guys of kids playing and college coaches being there recruiting. Where now the college coaches don't even show up anymore because. They can go to the computer and go right to the transfer portal. Yeah, yeah, but then, but then, but the, but the players, if you you don't know where your skill sets are, and you don't even know for yourself. You know, no matter what you do, if you're an actor, you go to acting class to learn how to do certain things. As a player, there were so many times I was in the park by myself, seven o'clock in the morning, and just I had I changing my jump shot. I changed my jump shot like eight different times <laughs> until I found something that was comfortable. Right. And what made and, and and but but that doing that work that was me working on my game. That even if I was doing the wrong things, I'm working at it by myself. And like I said, I'm changing my shot. What's wrong with this? So you know what? I'm not getting lift. I'm not doing this. I'm not the follow through is not right. I'm putting the ball too high in the air. Blah blah blah. I mean, it's all those things, but you have to do those on your own. Like back in the day, third grade, second grade, first grade, you know, you're writing those big A's in the paper, right? Right, right. You know, that's practice. Yep. That's practice. And it's like, and you have to do it. Even if you do it mentally, you have to, you know, conjure up something in your head to say, you know, put myself in a position, say, there's three seconds left. Am I, can, what do I do? Because you don't want to be posed with that situation when there really is three seconds and you've never experienced it before. You know, that's kind of like trying to date somebody and you're shy. You're like, humming, humming, humming. You're not going to perform and do the right thing. You know, so the camps and the, and the individual workouts, that's a sorely missed process in our, in our day and age in this society, and especially because a AAU, they don't have time for that. And even if you don't play AAU and you play rec ball, there's, there's no time for practice because it's right away jump right to the games, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a sad situation. Yeah. For those of you in the room, I'm about to click off Instagram right now. Please join us on YouTube. Join us on YouTube. We're on YouTube Live right now. All right. Yeah, you know, that's that's. And, and saying that, at what age did you you know start to take the game serious? Oh man, well, and and with my story, it was kind of hard because there was some issues. Um, I have a condition that I knew I had since I was like seven years old called Marfan syndrome. And it's what um, Isaiah um, Austin from Baylor has, why he wouldn't get drafted. And I knew I had it. So I was like not being allowed to play because my mom wouldn't let me play. Mm. It was like a no. And my dad was like, let him do whatever he wants. But my mom was trying to protect my health. So 
at the age of like 12, 13 years old, when I was with Gil, that confidence level that they gave me put me in that mode. And that's when I knew that I was a good player. Because I'm playing against guys, like I said, George Johnson, Bernard, Vinny right. Johnson, and I'm doing okay. So, and I'm talking about like before high school, like that, that early, you know, summertime. So I knew there was something right. So I didn't want to give up that path because, you know, I was in the right path of having success, but I'm around good players. Everybody around me is a good player. Everybody, you know, the guards, the forwards, the centers. So Tell them, yo, E, just, just listen. If you think about how many guys that, uh, hold on, let me show I tag you in this. Uh, how many guys that you had to go through or play with that were good? You know what I mean? It wasn't just like, one guy, you know, it was several guys who were really good that you had to kind of get through or prove that you were one of the best. Yeah, I mean, and, and and well, for me, I played as a freshman. So as a freshman, I'm playing against, you know, Alex Aldridge, you know, like I said, you know, Butch Lee was a senior when I was a freshman. Bernard, wow. you know, so those guys. So, I mean, so I'm playing against them. By the time I'm a senior, you know, I don't even remember who was like the young guys behind me, but you could just imagine, you know, I played against eight age groups of guys, four years older than me, and then four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So I've seen so many good basketball players in that era that it was ridiculous. And, and, and in some cases, every school you, you play against, there's three players that are all really good basketball players. At minimum three, you know. And then if you face the others during summer league, they had game two, but they yeah. were just behind those three or four dudes that they couldn't really show how good they were. They were. Yeah, that's right. And then you're talking about, and plus you're talking about the other boroughs as well. And so, I mean, there's like so many guys, man. And it's weird because I kind of know where the bodies are buried. And I know who they are. And, and and it's like so many basketball players I know that were really good, you know? And I mean, you just look at the all city list and the all, bar, all, all, like all Brooklyn, like A, B, and C, or one, two, and three, and the same with Manhattan and Queens and the Bronx. There's so many really good players from that era, you know? And, and you're not gonna get away with having like an easy night. Right. You're not getting away with that. So if you play well, it was, a, it was, it was earned. Every game was an earned experience, you know. Listen, I always say this. Rolando Blackman made second team all city, but got a scholarship at Kansas State. That's not happening today. No. You're second no. team all city, you lucky if you get into a division one. Yeah, yeah. And it's weird because I have an article that shows back in that day, uh, college coaches... And I think it was an article with um, Tom Tchaikovsky. And it was like, any time a college basketball coach is looking for a play basketball player, he's going to Brooklyn and Queens first. Yes. No matter yes. where he is. That's now, right. they don't even, I don't even know if they go to New York anymore. No, they really do. They really do. But they'll go there. But what happens is that the sneaker companies are taking the plays away from there. So this water, that's not like, it's, it's not totally watered down, but the, the cream of the crop that's there, you'll never know they were the cream of the crop. And you find them at ING or something or Mount Verde. And it turns out that his hometown was Brooklyn, New York, but he's in Orlando now. So, you know. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's the gift and the curse. I always says the gift and the curse. I think the more money you pour into things, the less quality that you're going to get out of that. Right. You know? Right. So yeah. who, who was the best player in your neighborhood when you was coming up? Who was the guy, like, when you was coming up? Whoa, well, I lived in two communities. I was in Flatbush and in Crown Heights. So um, <laughs> in, in Flatbush, the best player that I can say, and it, they were older guys older than me, would probably have to be George Berry. Mm. Played at Erasmus. And I think George played at University of Buffalo. Um, but George Berry legit player man i'm serious you know what i mean and it's like you know um you know jump shot mid-range rebounds 
um, plays defense, runs the floor. It's like, you know, a power forward, small forward type of, you know, combo player. Um, and at the time he was like four years older than me. And it was like watching George was a, was a thrill for me because he was powerful as well. You know what I mean? Um, and, and Crown Heights, I can't, I don't know. I don't know what to say. It probably be myself, all that matters. Because Did they weren't the same time as Bernard Harden? Yeah, well, that would be Bernard, right? Because Bernard was up there by Lincoln Terrace. So, so it would be Bernard, exactly. But Bernard was like um, six years older than me. So, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. but Ber yeah, but Bernard, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> gotcha. We're gotcha, buddies, gotcha. man. We're buddies. So he's a good, really a good player. He taught me a lot because we play one on one, you know, and show me stuff. It's like, hey, you know, young young buck, man, this is what you got to do, you know, because he's beat me down. It's like. And it's a lesson, you know, I'm getting a lesson from a guy that's established himself. That's right. You know, and, and he, and I don't know if he knew he was doing that and I don't know. And I, and I didn't know he was doing that, but when you walk away and you're hurting, you know, it's a lesson, you know, lesson to be learned. So yeah. why did you decide to go to Midwood and not Wingate or boys and girls? And things well, my, like my, my school was, boys to, excuse me. Well, actually my school was supposed to be Erasmus because I was in Flatbush. Mm. And so um oh, Erasmus, right yeah so it's like and there were like a bunch of us that didn't go to Erasmus and my buddy Les Miller was supposed to go to Erasmus six seven he went to Brooklyn Tech you know Calvin Hicks was supposed to go to Erasmus he lived in Flatbush he went to you know Brooklyn Tech as well I went to Midwood because I went you know academically my sister was there and so I was grandfathered the opportunity to, to go somewhere else and you know, once again, my mom was like, let me get you away from all the, you know, your friends. And I want you to be an academic person. Um, Because like I said before, she didn't want me playing. She wanted me to play. I, I, she told me, I, well, she had me go to lessons for classical guitar and piano. So it was like, forget the sports. But what I was doing, I was taking, I was taking the guitar and putting it in the bushes and going to the park. <laughs> You know, but um, but yeah, that's it, and it's crazy because during that time frame, you know, Flatbush and all those guys should have went to Erasmus, and we all end up going somewhere else. And so I, that's how I end up being at Midwood, and it was a decision made early, so Midwood knew I was coming. You know, and um, they just embraced me, man. It was you know a good place, and but Erasmus, they end up having Andre Gaddy, Riley Clarita, may he rest in peace. So there's like five or six of us that could have been there and would have been a super powerhouse. We're all um, 2000, well, I guess we're all uh, 1977 grads. And there would have been like seven of us that were all six, six and bigger. And, you know, definitely all, all Brooklyn level players, you know, but I went to Midwood and everything worked out fine. You know, what, what, what were some of the things that uh, you had to learn to adjust once you got to Midwood? And then what years uh, did you start playing varsity basketball? Um, 73 uh, was the first year. Um, I, things I had to learn, because it's weird, at Midwood, there's an annex. So all the ninth graders went to a different you know, building, which was like on the other side of Ocean Parkway. And so, you know, going to school there and then traveling and having to leave, you know, like on time. Because I'm not with the seniors, juniors, and sophomores in the main building. Right. So I'm rushing over there to go to practice, blah, 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 blah. Nobody knew who I was, but they heard. And um, <laughs> something happened that made everybody understand what I, who I was. But, um, and I'll explain that. But, um, but that was it. I had to learn the, that more mature environment of high school because I was still in kind of like being in the ninth grade, you're still like in the eighth grade because we're away from everyone. Right. You know, so not being mature is probably what I learned. Um, but as a basketball player, and, and the, I remember this very well, first day, of high, first day of practice or tryouts, and I said I had to do something different that made me different than my everybody in there. It was like 40 guys trying out. None of them could compare. You know, some of my friends, you know, that were good players, JV guys. So I went and dunked the ball. I almost hit my head on the backboard. And I don't know if you know Midwood High School gym, but it's like a you know a matchbox. Right, right. So right. I'm ducking out of the way, and I land, 
and I turn around and everybody is watching, is staring at me. And, and I was up there high because I had been gay on my legs, make, you know, loosen up. And I took off, man. It was like I land, I turn around, and everybody's staring at me like, whoa, like, like who, who the hell is this guy? Like all the vets and the upperclassmen, they were sitting on the side, you know, looking at who was being, you know, um, trying out. And it was just, everybody was just stunned about how high I guess I got up. And that, and that right there said to me that, I mean, I got cocky with it. You know what I'm saying? Like you do something and somebody, you know, shows, you know, uh, that they like it, you know, it's kind of like, I'm, so I'm pushing my chest out now, you know? So, uh, but they accepted me just like that, you know? But I think that that, 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 that incident made a big difference because now it was like, whoa, this guy, you know, he plays, he gets up, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. You was a freshman when that happened. Yeah, yeah. And um, I started it. No, yeah. Especially back in those days, you know. I'm um, not saying everybody was a Duncan, but you get a young guy who come on the court and he exhibit those skills. You know, everybody's like, man, we got to yeah. watch and, out and, for this guy. And I, and I tried my best to do the the most incredible Dr. J Dunk I could think of. Because I, I had the big fro and everything. Right, right. and. Um, and it worked. I mean, it worked out, man. But it's like, and it's weird because I didn't start my first high school game. And but after that, I started because I, I think uh, my first high school game, I think I shot like eight, eight for nine from the field coming off the bench against Lafayette. They beat us by 40, but I was killing them. <laughs> you know, when, when you go back, we talk about all of these schools that was good, like, the, you know, the Lafayette's, your guys, uh, Erasmus, um, like powerhouses, and then come the early 80s and mid 80s, and the, the school's kind of like they're not as good as they were. I understand because Lincoln is going through that right now. That's why I went Lincoln. So we're going through that transitional period now. Uh, DeWitt Clinton went through it, um, and a lot of other schools go through it. You know, Jefferson had their time, and now they're back in the in the in the light in the limelight so it you know tom and, and the switching of players and the switching of the guards that's going to happen so i tell yeah. people all the time you know you're well they're losing a couple of years and you'll be down the next yeah well the reason why it's happening though is that nobody's taking the game serious anymore so you even no matter what used to happen back in the day everybody wanted to play. So right. every school of guys in that school, you know, they, they aspire to want to be like, hey, you don't know whether I say, hey, you know, I'm going to go and play for that team. I'm going to do my thing. No matter what school it was, was it South Shore, Boyce High, you know, John Jay, you know, Lafayette, whatever the case may be, Canarsie, they have, every school, excuse me, every school had skill sets on those teams. So now I guess, and I'm not there, so I can't say, but, I don't think that there's a love to want to play for your high school anymore. No. You know? No. And it's kind of like watching the high schools. And I watched a couple of games like on like people's videos and tapes, and it looks more like a junior high school game, even skill-wise. You know, and no disrespect to those young athletes, but I'm just saying it just looks no, very No, if you look at the 1981 game between Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin, the first national televised high school game, that looked like a college game. Mm. The, those kids, uh, the way they played and and just how their bodies were, it was just a, a different time. You know. Yeah, you're talking about Ice Ice Reynolds and Andre yeah, Irvin. Yeah, 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 yeah. And both teams, both teams were like that. You know. Yes, yes, and they, it, they were good. Yeah, and it's weird because I, I live in Charlotte now, and and I, the high school teams they 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 fight to make sure that their players are fit and big and, you know, that they look, you know, like they don't look like little kids playing basketball. Right. You know, and even in back down there, they play football and basketball. So they're right. in the weight room. Yeah. 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 In the weight room. Yeah. But back in our, my era, everybody was like, like my, was I was a center. You know what I mean? So, and after my freshman year, it was like, you know, I put him at forward and, because they knew that I was going to transition down to guard eventually, you know? So, I mean, so, but there was like seven guys on our team that were my size. 
When you did know? that transition happen? When did that transition happen? And when did you start to come into your own? Well, the transition happened from messing around with Gil and George because playing in the summer, there's bigger guys on the team, so I can play small forward. And that's that that and that right there did it. And it kind of made you think, you say, you know what? And plus people tell you, you know, you're gonna be a guard in college. So now you're working on those other skill sets and the teams you're playing for, you're pushing for that. Then you talk to your high school coach and you're like, I'm, I want to play the position. I want to play at the next level. Right. And so if in my situation, they they were able to accommodate me, but some schools don't have that ability. You're the biggest guy on the team. I'm not going to put you at guard, you know, um, unless the coach has that understanding and sees your skill sets. But, um, but that transition happened like in the summertime High school, it happened like uh, two years later. So as a junior, that's when it happened in high school. But in the summertime, right away, after my freshman year in high school, every team I played for, I was smaller than most of the guys. I mean, when I played with Riverside, you know, it's like, you know, Albert King's a small forward. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in that two, three type of position, you know, as well. Um, and that made it easy because, but you're hungry for it. You know, you, it's like, I don't, I'm tired of playing with my back to the basket. Right. But you're, you're hungry to be, you know, on the perimeter to do different things, learn something else about the game other than drop steps and, you know, posting up people and boxing out, you know, I want to learn how to do other things. How do I play people on the perimeter? And, and but it, my, is my foot speed fast enough to do that? And if it's not, then I got to get on the track. You know, I got to do something. So, and that transition was everyone uh, adult wise in my life was um, focused on ensuring that I did make that transition. So no one was putting me at center as a South at the end of my sophomore year. It was more like your, your guard. So, you know, forget that. And like I said, with Riverside, you know, you're playing the two and the three 90% of the time now with Jeff Rulins you know, six eleven. So um makes life a lot easier when you got so that. Jeff, Jeff was on that team too, as, as well as Albert King when you guys won the nationals and uh No, nah, that was the that was the year before the year before I went. And that was um with Al um Earl Fuller, Ray James, Willie Sims. Um and we came in we came in third. Yes, yes. But the year after that when we won the whole thing, that was Rodney McRae, Jimmy Black, Larry Washington, Frank Gilroy, me, um, Calhoun from Jeff, um, Mike, um, Rob Price from Lafayette, and um, and that's when we won the national championship. And that was what, and that was when AAU became something, you know, because that in 77-78. AAU started having, you know, their national championships in Florida. What was the BCI? What did the BCI stand for? That was Basketball Congress International. And that, that was, it was run out of Scottsdale, Arizona, Vegas, Utah. Those are the three locations. So, you, you know, you know, they had the Watts teams, the, you know, LA, all, all that, you know, California, Nevada teams. Almost every state was represented. Um Cecil Watkins and them used to have a team. Elm Corps would go as well. Yeah. And I think that, yeah. So, um, but I, when I went back with the, you know, the second year with Rodney McRae and Jimmy Black and them, me and Larry Washington won the national championship. That's the wow. bottom line. Because Larry Larry got MVP because he had the winning shot. He had 16, I think, or 17 points. And so did I. We were killing him, you know. And, and, and it was just, for me, Everybody that we were playing against, it was just, we were just rolling over them because Rodney McCray was a beast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, definitely. He, and he makes, he made life easy for you, man, because he's clearing the boards, pitching it out, you're running New York style basketball, you know, and we got all those good guards, Larry Washington, Jimmy Black. You know, Jimmy was Michael's point guard at Carolina. Yeah, I think you know? he, I don't know, Jimmy, if you are the one that's, Commenting on my YouTube page, please, brother, come on the show. I know you. He's been commenting on, and it says Jimmy Black. So I asked him. I said, is "This Jimmy Black that played for North Carolina," um, because a friend of mine is very close to him and told him about the show. 
Right. So I, I would love to have them on. Uh, the McCray brothers. I need to be up at Mount Vernon and get you guys in the show. <laughs> so yeah, this, this is this is awesome right here. Yeah. Um, who who was the who was the coach uh, of Riverside back then? It was Mr. Loich. Mr. Loich was in charge. Um, the year before, it was Mr. Loich and Lester Roberts from Brooklyn, USA. So hold on, time out, time out. See, next show, I promise, I will have my whistle. I will have my whistle. Those, that's, I'm gonna incorporate that to the show. That's gonna be on the show soon. So it may get in your nerves, but it's gonna be incorporated. Just wanna let you know. Lester Roberts was part of Riverside. Was this before he created Brook, uh, Brooklyn USA? No, it was like, it was like a, 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 a I guess a combination. A, a, a combination of, you know, Brooklyn USA, which would get the Brooklyn players with Riverside. And so they were by, like both co-coaches that year. And I, I'm pretty sure the years after, because they were both involved, Mr. Lloyd and um, Lester Roberts. The, the year after though, that I went, when we won the title, it was um, Mr. Loich and um, Kenny um, Williamson, Eggman. Yes, yes. Yeah, may he rest in peace as well. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, Eggman, Eggman. <laughs> he was he was a good man. I'm telling you, man, because he was that guy that you could talk to, you know, about basketball during the game, and you know, he'd like give you a nod or whatever. Um, to motivate you to say, yeah, you know, go ahead, do your thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, and that that's who was coaching when, but I know the first time we went, it was Lester Roberts and Mr. Loich, you know. Wow. Salute to both of those guys, man. Made yeah. such an impact on, on New York City basketball. Yeah, yeah. Um, what division was you guys in when you was at Midwood? We were in the, um, I guess it was like, I guess the B, the, the, the B division. Of course, it was us, Erasmus, Madison, um, who else was in there? Yeah, who else? Uh, New U I think was it New Utrecht? Probably New Utrecht. Yes. Yeah, yeah. New Utrecht. Yeah. Um, was Lafayette in that division? No, nah, they, yeah, they were in a different one. Yeah, they were in a different one. But we were in that in that that division. Wingate. Wingate okay. was. There. Yeah, that's what it was. So, um, and it was you know a pretty decent competition. Well, really good competition because every like I said before every team had like three or four guys on it um playing against the guys as a freshman and the older guys like playing against Bernard whoa <laughs> I mean as a high school player that was an experience and um George Johnson those are like the you know the big guys of that era 73 um you know and then we played Lafayette twice and you know George Johnson comes in and he just takes over everything you know i mean six eight guy who does everything well in the post area you know controlling everything and you know how bernard is you know you just don't stop him at all no no you know no. and then you're playing or fdr was yellow school that's you know with Vinny. yeah Vinny you know? johnson the microwave yeah, you know but then you know he's getting 30 i'm getting 30 though as a as a sophomore i'm getting 32 so you know i mean I, it's for me because it's about and that's what people say. It's like, it's about the buckets. You make the buckets. And for me, it's like, I make a bucket. Uh, there's no celebration. I'm, it's just, I'm like a machine. You play the game like a machine. I'm not celebrating because I made a shot. That's, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, I'm celebrating when I make 14 shots. You know what I'm saying? But now everybody celebrates when they make a shot. And I don't understand that. Because the worst thing that you can do coming from Brooklyn is to incite your opponent and to celebrate incites an opponent. You start celebrating, you do something against me, it's gonna be a problem. Just like just like Horford with, with the Greek freak. He got right. him back, you know. So, you know, you don't incite people by those celebrations, man. You play the game and score your points and do what you got to do and you go to hell home, you know. And if you don't do it well. Believe me, the coaches I play for have your ass in the gym the next morning, or 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 running in the park that night that after the game. George Murray and Gil Reynolds make your make you real make you run home, you know. So, but that's why the game is is so different now. You know, no cel everyone celebrates stuff right away, and to me, it was just score points. 
you know, be, be, be efficient as a scorer. You know, I don't want to take 40 shots since I got 20. I better have 20 points if I take 40 shots. But I'm scoring 20 points and I'm taking 14 shots, 12 shots. You know, and that's, and that's efficiency. You know, and nobody speaks about that. They want to talk about the analytics. The analytics are about efficiency. That's what they should be. But, you know, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm yeah, gonna leave that alone. I, 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 I don't. I'm like to play the analytics game. It's just like stats and yeah. what the computers say is gonna make you a good player. That's, no, that's that's for somebody else. Yeah. Now that we're on the subject, how was it? Uh, the social aspect of you transferring, uh, transitioning from school to home, and especially at night uh, in the Midwood neighborhood, going home. How was that? <clears throat> Uh, well, for me, Midwood High School is like in the, I guess, um, like a the Jewish area, you know, Bedford Avenue area. So for me, it was pretty easy. Okay. But I lived all the way by Eastern Parkway. So, you know, in order to get home, that, that transition is like two buses. And getting on the bus, in, you know, at Midwood is easy. Getting off that bus and getting on that number 46 bus, the Utica Avenue bus, that's the problem. Because then you're like, you know, what is Avenue H and yeah. Utica Avenue? That's uh, that you're you're on that you're on that borderline, you know, where you're possibly getting chased home or whatever, you know. Um, so we did a we learned our lesson and we just took the Notion Avenue bus all the way down. 44th Street. Yeah, yeah, take the right. 44th straight down the Empire to 47, you know. So and that we got smart about that because of the problems that that arose. Because we had problems everywhere. We play against New Utrecht, running home. FDR, running home. You know, uh, Madison, running home. She said, Bay, running home. And it's it's crazy because I know those communities and there's minorities in those communities. So, like, but you, you know, you have the faction of young people wanting to confront you, and that's what that is, you know. Um, I understand. We had a, a playoff game at New Utrecht. Um, against boys and girls, and after the game, um, there was a huge fight between uh, Bed Stuy and Corny Allen, or as they say, Cross Town, right? And Corny Allen, and they kept us in the locker room like an hour and a half, two hours. We couldn't even leave. Um, and then once we made our transition to the training station. We got chased. And you know how long it is from the U trick to the train station. We got chased that whole way. And luckily by the time we got upstairs, the train was coming. It was like and it, and it seems warrior. like it and it seems like it was by design that they made that school that far away from the train. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, this is this is we're putting it over here so that these two y'all can chase those guys. Because it didn't, it, it wasn't just our sport. Every sport that was played, they had the same problem. You know, if you played football, you know, you had that problem. But see, with football, it's a little bit, might have been a little bit different. But this is the thing that's so different. And everywhere else in this country, we were traveling on mass transportation. Yeah. As high school players, as, as middle school players or students, we're getting on mass transportation with rapists, killers, muggers, nice people, bad people, adults, little kids. You know, and anywhere else in this country, School related, yellow bus. Yeah. Yellow bus. New Jersey, right across the border. I mean, yep. the water. Yellow bus. But yep. we were travel, we're traveling as a team with the bags and the balls and everything on a New York City bus. And I never understood until I became an educator because I thought the schools owned the buses, but we outsourced. Yeah, those buses are all contract. Yeah, but not, that's a whole different aspect. That yeah, I can go on but, to but, that. but 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 and, and not just for students, but for the events. If you have a yes. game that you should get, be able to get on the bus, and I never got on a on a yellow school bus until my daughter was going to school in New Jersey. Yeah, never. And it's like, but but if you went on a trip to the museum, you get on a school bus. That's when they got on the school bus. When there was a, you know, you go into the museum, a natural art or something. But other, but football team, basketball team, we're not getting on a school bus. It might that be showed now. You, that, yeah, that showed you how much they cared about 
New York City sports, and we yeah. just made it work regardless. Yeah, right? because it's our, because it's just the neighborhood, man. We know those neighborhoods, you know. Um, so for me, I, I was cool with it. You know, I mean, I just avoided the nonsense. But at Midwood, I didn't have any problems with people. Nobody bothered me. I was, I guess, I was liked by people. Um, and so I, I never really had any, that much issues, but as a team, we had problems with, with schools, you know, but as an individual, I never had any problems with anybody. Man, I, I've never gotten a technical foul in my life, you know, come to think of it, man, you know, um, but yeah, yeah man, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's to say that, did I ever get a technical foul when I played? I don't think so. I have no, I actually I, got, I think I think I think I think once once I start playing in the pro ams I think I may have gotten one. Yeah, um, I, 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 I don't have the, I don't have yeah, but I don't have nothing to say to the refs. I don't right. care what he does. I don't right. care what he does. That's it'll make right. no difference to me. Teammates, I tell my my, yeah. my team that when I coach. Yeah, I'm like blaming the losses on a referee. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I they, they, to me it's kind of like they're like police, and I'm not uncomfortable around police. I am to some degree, and you know what I'm talking about, but yeah. under normal circumstances, like back in those days, I walked by a police car, I don't care. Yeah. I, I, the block I lived on, there was a police car parked there protecting the Hasidic Jews, and he was sitting there all the time. He was like, hey, Eric, how you doing? You know, so for me, I'm like, they, they see me, I'm like, I'm the guy with the basketball. That's right. You know, in my neighbor, I went back to my community, Union Street, Albany Avenue Bakery. They make the best black and white cookies on the planet. I go in there with my daughter. She's like eight years old. And the lady comes from behind the counter and give me a big hug. It's like, ah, it's so nice to see you. But I'm like, whoa. I'm like, my daughter's like, dad, you know that lady? I'm like, and she's like, you're the guy that used to walk around with the basketball all the time. She gave me a big hug, you know? And it's like, and then the people standing behind the counter and like, Meshuggah. And it's like, and Meshuggah means crazy. You know wow. that, right? Yeah, that's what it means. So, and then the people, and then like, and she's like, yeah, she's introducing me to people. I was, I never had problems with people. I don't know why. I never did. Never, like I said, on the on the on the court, never had a problem with nobody. You know, in the neighborhoods, never had problems with people. Nobody, Eric was cool. Nobody messes with me, man. So mm. um my issues were health issues, not the people. The people are great, man. You know, um, but it's my my health was the problem, you know. Well, we we gonna get into that. I, I want to touch on that, um, but I I want to talk about uh, the Brevo Sports Foundation. How did you start playing? And then I, I want to jump into the Rucker situation, and then I want to compare the two. Right. Okay. Well, Brevo Brevo. Well, two reasons why I got involved with Brevo was probably because of playing with Restoration and George and Gill, but also um, the guy that ran it, uh, Mr. Trotman, his son and I went. He went to Midwood. And so I knew them well, and um, that that association because they had like that. There's a housing league, and I played for him sometimes. And in, um, in the summertime, with me and um, Kurt Redding, we played um, for him. So I got to you know, know like that family kind of intimately because we're friends, and um, and just playing in brief, what was kind of like was the most exciting place in New York City to play unless, other than the Rucker, to me. The most exciting place because it was stands-based. You know, the Coliseum and, you know, girls walking around, guys everywhere, coaches. There were college coaches sitting there. or It was music playing and um, all kinds of events going on there. They had, like, you know, um, these twirlers come in there or a band come through. So they tried to exploit everything to make it like an enjoyable environment. Never any guns going off or anything like that. Um, you know, maybe somebody got their bike stolen or something, but it was great. And then when you knew that a certain team was going to be playing, you know, when you knew Calvin Hicks and those guys was coming to play from Leftist Park, you know, that crew, the whole Leftist Park community was there. You know, when Albert was playing, you know everybody was coming to watch them play. You know, Brooklyn USA's playing. Got to come and watch Brooklyn USA play and stretch Graham and Earl Nesbitt in them, Rudy Johnson. So it's always, you know, that place was just, and it, plus it was multiple games. So it's like, you know, you, you know you're playing the second game and 
you know, you're getting prepared. You know, it's, it's kind of like up them lights, right? Yeah, you're getting prepared. You know, you're getting excited, the adrenaline's running. You know, you want to impress people because the crowd is, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you kind of like you got New York fans, Philly fans, then you know how crazy Philly fans are, right? That's right, and that's right. And they're gonna hold you responsible, you know, and then you you know, it's oh, I'm playing against Sam Worthen tonight. Oh, here we go. You know, because you know what you're going to be in for. I I better not slip when I'm standing in front of Sam because they're going to give it to you, you right. know. And um, and I, I, I'm not, this is not a brag because I'm not that kind of person, but. No, this is your night. I, this is your night yeah. I, yeah, but I've never, I've never had myself handed to me by anybody. Never. I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but in those years, it never happened. You know, I mean, I might have lost a game or we, we lose a game or something, but I can honestly say nobody has ever handed me my, you know, and just handled me. Was that a high school league, the Brief Boy Sports Foundation? Was it a high school league? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was high. Because well, when we were playing, it was high school and it was unlimited as well. So you would see unlimited guys playing like the Roland Orbrights and Fly, Jocko and them at that, you know, them playing. But there was also the high school games as well. And, and everyone kind of like knew it's like when you play in Brevoort on a team, you've arrived. Because there's no junk teams in there. Right. So that's right. number one. You know, it's not like, you know, the, the citywide teams, not everybody that's, that's in citywide is playing in Brevoort. You're right. not going to get let in, you know. And um, well, the guy, let's, I don't mean to cut you off. But the guys from Manhattan and the Bronx, they didn't come down to Brooklyn to play. Well, they did. But let me tell you how they did. And then you want to transition this into the Rucker conversation. Because when we went out there to Rucker, George Merton went and brought guys. And I asked the guys, say, hey, look, you know, um, my, um, um, Dave Britton, right, that played. Um, I would Dave go to Brand not Brandeis or Norm Scullard. You know, like we played against them in the Rucker High School League. And he was asking those guys, they were coming and playing with us with restoration and, and oh and, they were they were back in those days, they were coming yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. And it was like it was um I know definitely Dave David Britton did, and David's in Texas now. And um he definitely played. I know because we talk all the time and I and he definitely played. But now I'm talking about as like a whole, like a no a lot no. of us went uptown to play. Right. No, no. None of the, no teams ever came that I know of. And played in the uh, um, Brevo tournament. Nobody, maybe individual players, because yes. you know, but teams. And I don't know why. And that would have been the premier tournament to play in. Like they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have bypassed Brevo and played in Soul in the Hole. They wouldn't have bypassed Brevo and played in Tillery. They wouldn't have done that. You know. No, so. even when I was coming up in the eighties, Brooklyn. I mean, Brevo had the the most impressive high school tournament. And a lot of the guys from uptown wouldn't come down to Brevoort to play. Wow. It would just be the, the borough of Brooklyn battling against each other. That's why I guess what made us so good because we was all battling for supremacy. Yeah, and, and but, they, but believe it or not, I think there were Queens teams. And I think Elmcore might have had a team in, in Brevoort. Okay. So Queens would come in. Cause I know a lot of Queens guys were playing in the tournament, a lot of guys, you know, but, um, but Manhattan, the teams would not come down. And I mean, there were some great teams there, Millbank, Dykeman, yeah, yeah. Resurrection. I mean, these teams were really good, man. I mean, but the players, you know, my twin, Phil Kidd, you know, um, Artie Green, like I said, Norm Scullard, you know, um, Charles Caldwell, um, there's so many good players, Billy Goodwin and them. I mean, they they would never they never came and played in tournaments in Brooklyn. So what was the difference between the Rucker and Brevoort? What was the difference? Um, well, Ruck, the high school Rucker was played at multiple locations. Okay. The site bases like Colonel Young, um, 110th Street, Dykeman in the Bronx. So it was multiple locations. So, you know, and that's how that was. And then it was ran kind of similar like the NBA where it's like East and West. And then, you know, the winner plays the worst team like that, like that kind of playoff schedule. Um, whereas Brevoort was more, I think a kind of like a double elimination type of tournament, you know? Um, but yeah, the, but the Rucker tournament was more like standings and, 
you know, and, and that and it was hard because you're, we're playing in hostile territory every game. And we were running home from there, mm. running to get on the trains because they chasing us home, you know, and um, and you won back to back MVP at the Rucker, correct? Yeah, yeah, I won one the first one at 15 and the second one at 16. All right. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this. All right. Since you said you never had your, you know, your ass handed to you, who ass did you bust to let you know you was one of the best players in the city? <laughs> Don't make me do that. <laughs> um, but, but everybody. I mean, I, I played. <laughs> but, but no, but it's you just that. Don't you, let me do that. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, but it, no, but you play well. And that's it. I mean, our team wins and we play and I play well. And like I said, efficiency, that's what my mindset was. And it wasn't really disrespectful to guys because I was cool with those guys. You know, no, and, those, and it's no disrespect, yeah, yeah. but it, it may have been someone who, you know, maybe had a higher stature or a little bit more pub. And when you faced them, it was just like, you know what? I got the best of them that night. I, well, I, 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 well, it was multiple times because we played them three times, but I would say Artie Green's team. Mm, because we, was we, tough. Because, was yeah, tough. I mean, I mean, we're talking about a guy that if he, if you, if if you gave him the opportunity, you would, you would honestly see the the star in his converses, mm. eye level, because he could get up, and it was explosive, quick, you know, kind of similar, not powerful like uh, Eric Marbury, but explosive and quick jumping. And and when we beat them, that was like he was like the man in in, in in uptown. So beating them and doing really well against them, that was that that really said a lot. That really said a lot. Wow. Um playing in Brevoort and playing against, you know, guys like, you know, like playing against Albert and playing well against Albert. Yeah, I mean, and, and that, during that time frame, I knew how to play him because we played together a lot. So, and he was the best in the nation at that time, correct? Yeah, yeah, and 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 I would say um, a fine line, absolutely. I mean, people didn't know about Magic Johnson, but after that, definitely Albert because he was a smart basketball player. And a lot of people didn't expect that, but he was smart because of what Gil gave him. And he, and he was comfortable. He, it was a comfort zone for him because he was the special player. So he got the perks and, but he worked hard for it as well. Don't get me wrong, but he was a smart or is a smart basketball player. So his playing, but he made the game was easy for him. But what was, we, what, what would be hard is when somebody challenged him physically. And that's what I would do. But I didn't play against him a lot, but that's how you have to play Albert, you know, and because he's going to outsmart you, <laughs> telling you, he's going to outsmart you. Plus he's, you know, he's gifted. He has skills. Um, but but his dribbling skills were kind of not up to that par, but right. everything else, you know, you can't leave him open because he'll hit the jump shot, blah, blah, blah. Other guys like um, Kurt Redding, Jesse Massey, the, you know, the Brooklyn guys, those are uh, those are guys that were threats because they were efficient basketball plays. And that and most of us were in those in that era. You know, Orlando Blackman was an efficient basketball player. He didn't waste any of it. And that's what we were all taught. And you know that. We were all taught to be efficient. Like it, like making mistakes was frowned upon. Right. Your butt's on the bench. There's no, you know, participation trophies back in our day. Your coach, our coaches were hitting us. Right. You know, and some people would frown from that, but it's like, I, and it's funny because they never hit me. I've never gotten hit by Gil or George, but I, because I listened, but I listened. I did everything they told me to do. It's like, it's not hard to follow instructions. Now I might fail because the guy's better than me or dunk on me or steal a ball, but I'm giving it the effort that they expect me to give. And then they, or, or, cause otherwise I'm doing push-ups and duck walks and running around, you know, Wingate Park 40 times, you know, I don't want to do that. So it's like, it's, I'm better off, you know, skidding my knee for giving the effort that they tell me to give than to not do it and get the wrath of the coaches to be punished. Yeah. So, you know, cause punishment was part of basketball too for us. 
Not anymore. You punish somebody, their parents coming out of the stands, you know. Um, but I don't have a problem with being punished. That's okay with me, you know. Um, but so that so I mean, so yeah, but everybody we played against, everybody I played against, there was never, like I said, never a time where I somebody would get the best of me. So for me, it's just a you know, our average day out, you know, that and, you know, business as usual. Go out there, be efficient make good decisions, play good defense, be a good teammate. And that's the other big thing. Just be a good teammate and use my skills. And mm-hmm. and, and plus, you got to have some guards around you. Otherwise, you ain't going to do nothing. Oh, yeah. You, know? you definitely, definitely need that. New York City guards. You have a good New York City guard on your team. You're going to do work, you know? New Guard City. That's what they call us. How, yeah. how, was, how was Eric Marbury? Oh, man. It's weird because I know that family um, in a a kind of like a different way. Um, A good friend of mine named Dan James, who was from Honduras, was a distant relative of the Marbirds. And they used to to sell hot dogs and pretzels and on the beach. So I was out there with Dan and another cousin and Eric and we're like, get your sodas, get your hot dogs here. You know, walking out there, we're so tanned, we look Hawaiian. Right. Eric Marbury <laughs> was the strong. Well, he was the second strongest high school basketball player I've ever seen in my entire life. Mm. Second. Only to one guy. Sam Clancy. From Pennsylvania, um, all American. Sam was like he played in the playing football in, in the NFL. He went to yes, Pittsburgh. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and I'm telling you, I have never seen a human being built like that. I think that he could honestly, like, grab his kneecaps. He's 6'7", he could grab his kneecaps. And he was so bow-legged that if his legs were straight, he'd probably be 6'9". I mean, he was a beast. But Eric was so strong, man, that you had to find a way to beat him in a different way. Because he came out of nowhere. Because you know, being like you know, Lincoln kind of like you know, there's a distance like, from the rest of Brooklyn. So you know, you find out about this guy and you see him, and and we played together against the Russians at Columbia, and he had the whole Russian team stop and watching him dunk. I'm telling you, I mean, we're talking about stop and turn around. And just watch the layup line. Anytime he's when he's next one to get the ball, they stopped and watched him. And I'm talking about power dunking. <laughs> you know, and then you want to try and emulate that. It's like, man, I can't do that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he was strong. And plus he and, and he had an underrated jump shot. So you so and that's kind of like his counter. Like if you, you know, try to stop his drive so he won't dunk on you, he'll pull up. You know, and he was, he, he had man strength, you know, which is when you see man strength, that's a big difference. You Separate know. The, men, the, the men in high school from the boys. Yeah. And that, and he was really a strong player, but, you know, he lifted like crazy. They were lifting all the, look at all of them. They were all cut. But you know? they all worked on the beach. Yeah. They all worked on the beach. They all trucked through that sand. Yes. They worked in that sand. So yeah. they, they had a different regiment than the rest of us. Yeah. And I yeah. experienced that. And it was crazy, man. I'm telling you, but it helped. It yeah. helped. It really did. You know, shoulders. I, I was between the errors. So they had Eric, Don, then no more berries. And then after uh, my era, then you had Juju, Steph, and Zach after okay that. Yeah. yeah you know but he was he was a powerful player man he really was and um he was our first superstar he was our yeah. first superstar yeah yeah and yeah. I me personally I don't think I would have went where he went but because no, if he stayed if he like I don't really think again Ice did well at LSU a lot of us don't do well in the SEC and the Big Ten for some reason. Yeah. And I think Eric Marbury was a Texas, like a university in Texas type of basketball player. 
you know, or Auburn. Yes. Somewhere yes. like that. You know, not Georgia. You know, no, nowhere in Georgia. You know, um, because Texas would have, they would have saw him and been thinking that power, football right, right, strength. Right, and they right. would have, they would have optimized and 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 gave, gave him the ball and said, do your thing, young man. You know, but you know, things happen. Everybody, no one, and, right. so not everybody goes right. to the right school, you know. That's right. Yeah. So how, how was the recruitment for you out of high school? What school recruited you and why did you decide on going to LIU? Everybody recruited me. <laughs> I had, there were some problems. I had a lot of issues. Um, I had academic issues. I failed off the team as a junior. And, and, and prior to that, I was a 99 grade point average student, but I stopped going to class. Like, like I failed my classes because of lack of attendance. Mm. Because of the personal family issues I was having. My mother, like I said before, my mother didn't want me to play. And every time I went to play, I was getting punished. And so I said, well, you don't want me to play basketball. I'm going to stop going to class. And I was doing well. I had over 300 letters from colleges. Wow. I had five boxes, shoe boxes of letters. As a freshman, after my freshman year, five converse boxes of letters mm. and so failing off the team i let my teammates down in my school um one person in particular eric green who was my teammate very disappointing because that was his senior year and we were really good um that's the canarsie one the whole thing and um that was a, and i had to recover from that and you know, then the next thing that happened after that, my senior year, the, 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 the Sunday before school, I was playing in St. John's Rec. Um, guys got into a fight on the court. Guy, a guy lives on my block, right across the street from me. He's like six years older than me. And um, I tried to break it up. He wasn't trying to fight me. Leave. Next day, I'm walking down Eastern Parkway with my Riverside jacket on the the light blue one with the orange writing on the back. Right. And he's, and, and he, well, he's, uh, he, he's right behind me. I turn him on. He's like right behind me with a paper bag in his hand. So I'm like, he's like, what do you want to do now? So I'm like, took the jacket off. I'm like, ready to go. He pulls a meat cleaver out. Wow. A big meat cleaver. The it was at gun. least, <laughs> right. I, I'm telling you. And he swung across my body and I jumped back, but he caught me right in the groove of my arm. And he cut my leader and my vein and my muscle. And I was like, I had like 48 stitches in my arm. So I couldn't mm. play like the first half of my senior year as, as well. You know, so, um, but because I had the academic problems, I ended up going to, um, I reclassified and did the prep school at Lower East Side Prep. Mm. And um, while, and that's why I had the opportunity to play with Riverside again, because I was, you know, in that level. And so um, what happened is that after playing well in Arizona, Murray State was like emphatic about wanting me. And they had Gary Hooker, who was like three years older than me. He was red shirting. And so um, they said, well, you probably have to you know, sit out. So why don't you go to JUCO? So I went to Paducah Community College in Kentucky. It was like about 20 minutes from Owensboro. And um, I played there for my, you know, my um, freshman year in college first. And we were like 27 and three or something like that. And, um, but it, I got soured because of the Ku Klux Klan. You know, um, I got hurt really bad in the middle of the season. We were like 19 and one. Uh, no, no, we were like 19 and 0. And we're like number two in the country. And I got hurt bad on a road trip and they made me play that whole road trip. Hurt my ankle like real bad. And it's like, either you play or we send him back to Brooklyn. So right away, I was like, I'm not, I don't want to be around these people. And then the Ku Klux Klan is messing with us, you know, at the off-campus apartments. And so after, you know, classes were over and took the finals, I got out of there and never looked back. And guys used to ball at LIU in the, in the evening. So, and the guy that I told you about, that's family member of the um, Marbirds, I used to go and visit him because he used to sell hot dogs in front of LIU. And um, so he said, they they're balling in there. So I went in there and Rudy Johnson, Earl and Riley Clarita, all of them were there. And they were like, yo, we all transferred back. 
And I'm like, well, I don't have nowhere to go, quite honestly. I could go back to the JUCO. And so um, I went up there and talked to the coach. And it turns out that I could play right away because my grades were great. And my SAT scores were unbelievable as well. And, um, but there were no scholarships. So my parents paid my, my sophomore year, first year at LIU, my parents paid for it. Wow. Yeah, because there were no scholarships left. And I started, I think I, I don't, might have started almost every game, <laughs> I think, as a, as a sophomore, though. Yeah, Earl yeah. told me that, too. Like, a lot of guys went out of town, they, and it didn't work out of town. They came back to play. At, uh, yeah, it was like there were eight of us, eight yeah. of us. The whole team. The whole team and Andrew Bynum's um, father, Ernest mm -hmm. Bynum. Wow. And, and Rob Cole from East Orange, New Jersey, you know. Um, yeah, and so it's like it was a great situation, but they had players there. And but the problem was they were all too big. But you know, you're trying to start Riley Clarita at a you know a small forward, and he's like, you know, Carl Malone. So they had to make a transition to go a little smaller. So they put me at small forward. And that was, I was that transition guy, a good interior um, passer, you know, playing that Scotty Pippen role type right. of thing, so to speak. And, um, and that's how my career ended up being at LIU. But um, that was a big problem because I started out as the playing the two guard spot, but then Rudy and Earl were there. So it's like, Hey, give them the ball and let me be that glue guy between the big men, you know? And I and I ended up I had sacrificed a lot of my game for the greater good, you know, because I know Earl likes to go on people. Rob Cole guarded and go, Rudy. So I'm being a glue guy and sacrifice my own personal accomplishments for you know just to do what we had to do, you know. And, and you kind of made up for the fact that um, you let your high school teammates down, and then sacrifice and and doing what you need to do because you wouldn't go to school, right? Yeah. So later on, you get to repay that to your college guys. Oh, and without it a paid doubt. Off. It paid yeah. off because you guys went to the NCAA tournament, which mm -hmm. was the first time in school history, correct? Yeah, yeah. And that was, and, and I, I, I give the credit, the, the credit for that has to go to Rudy Johnson. Uh, may he rest in peace, man. I'm dead serious. I played this game, you know, as a, a amateur against a lot of really good basketball players. And I have not met anybody like Rudy Johnson. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, a leader, motivating, and a good person. Like, he's always supportive. Um, and he pushes, you know, like a way a coach would. And we really weren't getting that from the coach, but we are getting that from Rudy. And I'm going to be straight up honest. We weren't getting it from the coaching staff at all. Who was the, who was the coach at the time? It was, it was Coach Lizzo, um, Paul Lizzo. Yes. Yeah, you know, and 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 that yeah, and that's not in it, and that's not in his DNA, like to motivate us. That you know, his expectation is that you you do your job, you know. Right. But it's like, but we're not pros, we're not knowledgeable in that as to be thinking in that with that mindset, like it's a job. So you gotta you gotta get me there, you know. And um, but we still had success, even though I mean, with that faltering, you know, thought process with that. We still had good games. We played well. I mean, shoot, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I think, what, 3-0 and or 2-0 and against Mike Krzyzewski, quite mm -hmm. honestly, because he used to coach an army, yeah, and we, and we, and we beat them night. every yeah. time. Yeah, we beat them every time. So um, it was a good experience, but Rudy pushed us beyond that, you know, just settling and being average. And we, were, and we still didn't perform as we should have. We should have been even better than that. And there might have been some things that were in a, in a way that I'm not going to speak about, but, um, but yeah, because yeah, I mean, in that conference, it's a very, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a mid-major and on the, and probably on the low side of mid-major, right, right, right. fair field, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, um, but we were, but we would play well, you know, um, and it, we, and there was a lot of talent. I mean, we were like seven foot, six, nine, six, nine. We had size. We had everything that would have made us a decent Division I major power, even at the mid-major level. Um, but we had, we, but we we did we couldn't make sense of it until the latter part of that 81 season. You know, we struggled with trying to make sense of it. But then Rudy started saying, you oh, know, this is crazy. 
And we're all like freaking, you know, all city players, man. We're better than this. And he was my roommate, so I used to get it all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like every day he's like, Eric, you're better than this, Eric. Right. You know, but he's right. He's right. You know, and you straighten your mind out and the body will follow. And that's what happened. He got us all on the same page. And then things started happening, man. I'm I'm grateful for what he did. I really am. You know. What what was your your, your best game back then? That the NCAA game? Tell me about it. 24 points. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 12 for 14 from the field. Wow. Who did y'all play? Uh, VCU. Whoa. Yeah. And um, but see, they came out the gate on us wickedly. And before we know it, we're down by 20. Mm. You know, but then we started coming back and we got back to one, you know, down by one. And but then, you know, the, but, you know, the referees got us with the fouls, you know. Big man's got fouls. Rudy's got fouls, and um, and and those, you know, they whether well, they either transitioned to points, or they transitioned to loss of possession, and they would go down and score points again. So, um, so we 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 ran out of gas. But that was probably my best my best game, I guess, for the most part, as far as scoring is concerned. Um, and um, and and that was uh, my junior year. So I. have Right then and there, I knew I had kind of finally come back out of this funk, but I still had the disease. It's still yeah. That's what I was about to touch on next. Like with 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 uh, the condition that you have, when did it start? Really, the the, the show is the show is head. It, well, it was two heads that it shows. The first one is during the course of the career that it you know it, it it's it's kind of like it starts out as a heart murmur. And what it is, Marfan syndrome is you have um, your connective tissue, meaning your aorta and your arteries are weakened. And so the risk is that you it could rupture and, you know, it could happen from anything, a car accident, and that jolt can tear your aorta. Um, but I mean, because it's weak, but at the same time, no, there's a lot of issues that can cause for the heart. And for me, Panic ensues because you know you have it, so you're being cautious. You, you you know, so you turn it off sometimes. You turn that basketball fire off because you're you're scared, and it's a and it's a fear that you have as an adolescent, so it never goes away. You know what I mean? It's something that you know is lurking, and you don't know how because you don't understand that you're a kid, but it's there. And so those things are always there. Older I got, I well, this is the other thing, I was. And I was strictly advised never to ever lift weights. I've never lifted weights in my entire life. Never. Because it puts pressure on your heart. Yeah. And they wanted me to stay away from that. So I couldn't do those things. So even down to my skill level, I could have never gotten strong like Eric Marbury, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't lift weights. And I was the captain at LIU and, we, and, and I'm in charge of the weight room and I'm sitting chilling. And then Riley and guys are using the weights and I'm sitting there chilling and I, cause I can't use them. I don't want to chance anything. And I don't know what's going to happen because they don't even know this disease that well back then, you know, cause this same disease killed uh, John Ritter mm, from yeah. three's company, yeah, Bill Paxton from Bill Paxton from Twister. Um, Abe Lincoln had the disease, but we know what happened to him. That was um, Mr. Booth did that. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. And um, my dad, my brother, and all of my father's brothers all died from it. Wow. Yeah. So, um, but what happened is later on in life, you know, after moving to North Carolina, um, my aorta tore. And it was um, St. Patrick's Day, 2006, and they repaired it with pig skin. And... Um, it was bad because what happened, I, I, um, I got um, compartment syndrome in my arm. And so they had to debreed the arm and, and relieve the pressure. The arm was, my arm swelled up real big. Hmm. And um, when they debrided it, they had to open it up. And so you can see the scar here. Right. It's on both sides. I could see through my, my arm. Hmm. And um, so I had to walk around with a wound vacuum from the military in order to close this because it wouldn't close. Hmm. And um, what happened is that the muscles in my arm deteriorated because it was getting air in it and all that. So they had to take the muscles out. And, um, but I got better, I'm fine, right? 
And then 2016, it tore again. And then they, so they took out part of my aorta and put a mechanical one in there. And um, that's when this happened. Wow. And they took half of both of my feet because these were complications from the surgery. My surgery was 26 and a half hours long. Wow. And they give you medication to push your blood to your torso. And the risk is the longer the surgery, the more that the extremities might not come back. Well, 26 hours later, my hand and my feet were as black as my shirt. And I freaked out. And they said, you're going to have to amputate it. And I was like, get that off of me, man. My hand looked like a mummy's hand. I'm like, get that off of me. You know, and um, I, I, had, I was in a coma. I died twice on the table. And um, I just kept fighting. You know, it's like that. The, I had the, you know, the um, ventilator. I was on the ventilator thing down my throat, which, you know, with the pandemic, you know, People talking about you don't want don't you don't want to get on a ventilator. Nah. You don't want to get on a ventilator, bro. <laughs> you know, so I'm just saying it's like all of those experiences, they happened after my playing career. But if I didn't follow the rules and 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 give it a break and, and stop playing after my career was done in college, um, I probably would have died. If I had been lifting weights, I, I would have been like a Reggie Lewis or uh, um, what's his name? Hank Gathers. Gathers. Hank Gathers. You know, and and imagine if they had got help during it, or if they had a family that they had those things, they would have been told that they couldn't ever play again. And I knew that was going to happen to me eventually because of the family dynamic. And that's the biggest part of, the, of this story. My mother was the fund manager for um, a law firm called Proskow. And I know you heard of that place because I think Pete Johnson had mentioned that he worked yeah, with them, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, my mother put in 30 Pete years there. Yeah. yeah. My mother put in 30 years there as the head fund manager. No money moved in that law firm unless my mom said it was okay. And at, at 12 years old, I met David Stern. And he was just, he was the head lawyer for the NBA at the time. And he was like, you know, I went to smack, half a day one day when had lunch with my mom. Sitting on eating lunch, all of a sudden he walks up with another NBA scout and she leaves. And then sit down and say, Hey, how you doing, Eric? And say, you know, let me tell you something. Your mom wants to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, Yeah, because the things you're saying, it's like her words are coming out of your mouth. Don't play, focus on your education. And say, Yeah, she told us to talk to you. And she was trying to shut down and protecting me, her son, yeah, yeah. Yes. from, you know, some, some ill-fated. she saw you know, what happened. She saw what happened to your brother, your dad. She saw what happened and yeah. what could have happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a crazy scene, but, you know, but I fought it because I want to play. I want to play. And I ended up being good at it. But, you know, so that distension and not being mature, you know, you're a kid. You're making all wrong decisions, doing everything wrong, you know, cutting class and say, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to, fine. I'm not going to class. I wouldn't even get out of the bed, you know? And so, but I paid the price for that. And like you said, I ended up, you know, rekindling that and thank goodness because of, you know, George Murden and then Riverside, them supporting me to, for me to get back in it because, and it's not a brag, but I never had academic issues. None. I'm a, I'm to me, I'm a math brainiac for all that matters. Right. You know, I got like, no questions wrong on my math part of my SATs. Wow. Zero questions wrong. So English, I might have messed up. <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying academically, I can handle that information. But I just gave it up. And, and a, 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 you know, immature response to a situation that could have been resolved. Or I could have just accepted it and, and not played basketball or any sport. But, um, but it all worked out. But we'll look what happened afterwards. Later on in my life, you know, everything's all okay. But then all hell breaks loose, you know, and still being able to sit down here and talk to you about this and, and share those experiences. I'm grateful for all of that, you know, because I could, I could drop dead while we're talking. That's how bad it is. And it tore a third time right before the pandemic taking my wife to work six in the morning, getting gas. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose in my body. Paramedics come. I have a tear in my aorta again. 
they, they won't do the surgery because if they do, it'll kill me because it's half a centimeter away from my juggler vein. Mm. They sent me home. I mean, they sent me home to die because they can't do the surgery. So a year later, get an MRI, it healed itself. Whoa, thank God. So I'm sitting here chilling before you, you know, um, with that in your head to say, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I'm kind of like you're walking on eggshells, but I don't want to walk like that. So I'm walking regular. Whatever happens, people look at me and say, well, I'm surprised. Well, I didn't know that there was a problem. Yeah, because I'm not going to lay down and, and die from this. I'm going to get up and do whatever I can, when I can, do what I got to do. You know, I do my landscaping. I do the stuff, you know, around the house. I, I, I do a lot of things with my hands. You know, I built this room, as a matter of fact. It's my man room. You know, wow. I built the, I built this, I built this room myself, man, you know, um, with one hand, with one hand, you know, because I'm not going to let something stop me. Like I told a young lady two days ago, not going to let life's experiences take away my joy, you know, because, because, because this disease doesn't have that right to take that away from me. If I'm still here, I'm going to be Eric. You know, and do as much as I possibly can, help people or whatever, you know. Um, nobody's helping me, and I'm not asking for any help. I'm just doing it on my own, just staying focused. And um, and I'm using the basketball mindset to get through all of this. That family, you know, good brothers like yourself, man, Craig Booth, my, all my friends, um, they've all been so supportive. And that is it's almost, it's just really, really incredible, you know, thing to see how people are supportive towards you, you know, and, <clears throat> you know, people, people could just totally just say to hell with that guy. But um, there's a lot of respect in both directions. You know, I respect people. So they give it back, you know, and, um, but that's the, that's the Brooklyn way, man. That's how we do. Right. That's right. That's and that's, and, and that's not a joke. It's the truth because, and you, Pooh, you know, this because you said, how many shows you say you did like 230, right? Yeah. There's nowhere else in this country that 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 there is an association with athletes in, of an era of 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 years. That there's nothing like New York City basketball, and and nowhere else in this country. You know, you, you still talk to guys that you played against, right? Yeah. Like 20, 30 years later. Yeah. No, you're not going to find guys in California that are like playing in thirty and over, forty and over, fifty and over, or in Louisiana. That's that doesn't happen. You know. Yeah. And, and so and so we have a special relationship with each other that nobody can take that away from us, you know. And, and, and we're such in a small proximity, right, New York City. We're compared, when we talk about California, we talk about California as a state, right? So some of these guys, they don't see each other as much as we see each other. Right, across right. Across paths, no matter in, in, in any other state. In the five boroughs, you know, it just happened to be a a, a, a and it's, we got the rest of New York as well. Yeah. We got upstate New York. We got Long Island, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and such a and, big and, and it's just it's just a you're just a car ride away. Are you kidding me? That's and right. But, but we but we but we respect each other so much that it's like, and that's why even down to you asking me, like, who did I give the business to? It's like it's it's hard for me to say that because of the respect I have for those guys that I played against. But like I said, my you know, I see my answer was right away, all of them. But, you know, but there's a lot of respect. I play against a guy and, and, and get 30 on him. And then we're having a Pepsi later on that afternoon in, in East Flatbush. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's yeah. about. Yeah. Know? And it's no disrespect to anybody because I ask everybody that question. And, and I try to convey it to people in a way to where, you know, it, it could, we all play against that, that guy or girl with the big name or the big reputation. And it's just how well we match up. Right. You know, always compare the fact that uh, Jordan and I played against so many different high school Americans and like played against Lloyd Daniels. Uh, he have, he gave me and two other guys 47, right? But it, it I couldn't match to his level. I, I didn't give him 30. I may have 15 that game. But it was a game where um, at West 4th when I played against Anthony Mason on his first year on the Knicks. And just let me know that I can play with a pro, even though I played with a lot of them in high school, but he was already in the NBA, right? Um, 
think he had 34, I had 28. Or he had 32, I had 28. Whatever the case. And they won by one. And the reason why we lost that game because Earl Robinson <laughs> punches Elmer Anderson in the mouth and switches the game. But that's a, that's a whole thing, Earl. You know I love you. Salute to Elmer. But at that moment, it, it just let me know, you know, that I can play at a high level. Even though he got the best of me. And so yeah, people yeah. say I got the best of him. But he had the bigger name, the bigger reputation. And at that time, you know, I wasn't even playing basketball as consistently at that time because, you know, it was right after college and my mom died and I fell out of love with the game. But Earl and them convinced me to come up and play with them at West Fourth uh -huh. and take on that scorer's role. Yeah. Young and that and that's yeah, and that's the same thing for me. It's like I gave it up and and people, you know, they got, got me back in it, you know, started yeah, messing around yeah, in West. I, I, I because I ended up playing, I played in West Four, but then I ended up coming back and playing with Richie Parker. And 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 of course the team I was playing with there, they would Richie had those problems. Right. right and right. so, but I was like a senior guy. So I kind of tried to mentor him and talk to him, blah, blah, blah. But I was living in Jersey, so it's kind of hard to, to, you know, to transition it into something afterwards, like as he was at LIU or whatever. Um, really nice young man. I found that he deserved another opportunity because he wasn't the person that, that whatever that incident, I'm not going to speak no, to that. No, he wasn't. You know? and yeah, and, I actually but, and he deserved him. better. That's my guy, you know? yes. Yeah, and yeah. so, but I got dragged back into it. And then, you know, you know, I gave up the game, but then going to Wall Street and working, I started playing in the Wall Street League, you know, and I'm playing with Tony Hargraves and, you know, uh, Alex Middleton because I'm working for a company where, like Bear Stearns, and that, that the Iona is like the alumni are senior partners. So they're hiring the basketball team. And so you got Mike Ice and Peter Vesey there and, you know, and Tony Ayadi and, and Alex Middleton and Tony so, but then they started primetime, right? That's where primetime came from. That's that's what we played. That's who Anthony Mason played for. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, with Doug, for Doug, right? And and so I worked with those guys. And so they dragged me into that. We were back-to-back -back winners of that. Then I go and move to Jersey and do the same thing at Prudential. I start working at Prudential on their trading desk. And we got a basketball team. And we 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 the, the corporate league in New Jersey. We win, you know, back-to-back. -back, you know, I win MVP back-to-back. You know, at like I was almost 40 years old at the time. Wow. And, and and every time the championship game is played after Chicago Bulls next game. So I got like, you know, Rafferty and them, the commentators are still closing out the game. And we're running out as Mike and them running, you know, into the locker room. And then Rafferty is like, oh, you know, let's LIU guys and Iona guys type of stuff. So, you know, you're in the, always you always get roped back into the game. You know, because you love it so much. Like you said, you just love it so much and you want to play. But you know, so that was my transition out of playing. But then I started doing other things because I started, you know, teaching people the game. Gotcha. And, gotcha. And people gotcha. were sitting back and saying, like, my son and my brother in law was playing. He was real young at the time. And I go to the rec league and I'm seeing these guys playing. I'm like, seeing like eight guys didn't make the team and they walking out with their heads down. And I'm like, this is like corny basketball, rec league, but who's there for them? These kids walk away with their heads down and nobody gives a rest. That's guy, you know, parents are high, you know, putting their sons on the team and their son's best friends and, you know, in the suburbs. So I was like, somebody's got to be there for these kids that can't play. So I started doing camps for them. Before I know it, they were making teams over the other people, you know? And so then people started finding like, who is this guy? in South Jersey, teaching these guys basketball. And then I hooked up with your boy, Rich Brunson. And me and Rich, yep. so me, Rich, and Carl Anthony Town Sr. start running the New Jersey Wildcats organization and wow. training players. And that's how we got Andrew Bynum, you know. But also, I used to play, play with his dad at LIU, so it was an association. And, um, and it's funny because that's when little Carl, little Carl, cat was like seven years old <laughs> you know running around like little knucklehead on the court you know and um but we had but we were showing opportunity of doing certain things but then my daughter started playing and so i hooked up with mike flynn from the philadelphia bells 
<clears throat> and Mike mentored me in doing Blue Star Showcase camps. And I was a New Jersey team of the Philadelphia Bells, the first ever New Jersey team from the Philadelphia Bells. And, you know, they had like eight teams of right. every age category. And so, so now we're part of that big conglomerate. And that's Crystal Langhorn and um, um, I, 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 what's um, the girls from um, the school in Newark, Ajavon. And, um, and, and Candace Parker, because that's my daughter's age group. They're all the same age. So now she's around those players, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and dad is like one of the trainers or the um, directors of Blue Star. So I'm learning, you know, this process of, you know, information on the NCAA, talking to athletes of a higher level, what to look for, those type of things. And I'm just using, Lester Roberts, Gil Reynolds information in another environment, you know? And um, so my daughter gets a division two scholarship to a school here in North Carolina. We sold a house in Jersey and followed it because we're real close. And um, so then I started Elite 75 Prep. I went to an organization right. and said, yo, you know, this is what we do. And I got that from Blue Star as well as um, Brooklyn's um, talent search that they used to do at St. John's Rec. And it's just putting the guys together, evaluating them and letting them play, but have mentors and people who know the game and give advice, wisdom, information. And, um, and it just propelled me into that world. And I, I, I don't know how many guys, it's maybe about 25 guys that are in the pros, mm. you know, and being in Carolina, you know, I, all the guys from Carolina have come through the camp, Wake Forest, and, you know, NC State, Virginia, you know, Justin um, Anderson, you know, um, Kennedy Meeks, all of the all of the Carolina guys, you know, have run through us. John Wall has run through us. So Hassan Whiteside is our guy, you know. So um, just impacting these athletes in that manner because I didn't want to coach. You know what I mean? It's just winning and losing becomes an issue. But if I'm training you, I'm teaching you how to play the game. I'm making you think about what you're doing. You know, it's kind of like that thing that we talk about is like basketball wellness. Like if you catch the ball with three seconds left, are you comfortable in taking that shot or are you looking to pass the ball? With three seconds left, are you looking to pass that ball? And if you're not, then you don't have the wellness of basketball in mind because you're not prepared for an instance, which happens all the time in the game. The game of basketball is like a, a, a instances. Things happen. You got to react to them. If you ain't ready with three seconds, you have to, somebody's got to explain that to you. You're on the court, you got, then you, you got to, you're playing, you know, and that's been the driving force of everything I do is get kids, to, and male or female, to learn this game mentally so that, because you're, you're an athlete, you're gonna, your body's going to respond. But if your brain don't know, where are you? That's you that know? muscle memory right there. Yeah, all the time. Well, it's not just that, it's just the memory of knowing how to deal with that instance. You have to be a strategist. I, you have to have like that, the, the, the coach's clipboard. You're on the court playing. You got to have that clipboard in your head because you got to remember your plays. You got to know how to beat certain plays and how to jump screens and things like that. So you have to have that clipboard in your head to react to things. And if you're not prepared, if you react, you know, like too late, that's, that's the difference of having a car accident or not. Mm. is when you react too late. On a basketball court, that's the difference in getting the ball stolen and, and somebody having a highlight reel. And I'm not <laughs> I'm not looking forward to being somebody's highlight. <laughs> or, or, or anybody's poster. No, don't not me. You know, and 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 that's but that's the goal as a player is to always be in that mode. And and you have to teach these guys that and and not the elite players that are getting that info on a higher level, but it's the ones that are right below that will transition into that skill level if they have the information, you know, and they're sitting on the side waiting for somebody to come and, you know, drag them over and say, look, this is what you should do. And players do that to me all the time. They come back and I was like, yo, you know, my son is like playing so much better. And I'm like, yeah, because he's working on his game now. You know, like you said before, you don't, you know, you don't even know if you can make jump shots. You know, but you, you and you're not going to no camps. And so one year you're making, you know, you shoot and you make one out of eight. 
the next year comes by and you're still shooting the same way. And the kids call the set shot a jump shot. And I tell kids, you shooting a set shot. Yeah. Nobody's shooting a jump shot. Because yeah. when you play against somebody that can play, you'll realize, oh, I got to get up off the ground. Right. Because otherwise you won't be able to shoot over a person. No. And that's, and that's, and that's the kind of, that's the part of the game. It's like, we learned, our era learned how to shoot with a man on you. You know, the old broom drill and all of that stupidness. Like that was like somebody directly on you. So you knew how to take your shot because you had to get it over that person. Now it's kind of like, like you said, it's like a set shot. You know, you're, you're not putting any skill behind it other than, but, but, but there is skill in taking a set shot, but you can't score if a man's on you. And you see it in the NBA. There's guys that cannot score. And they're in a panic because they went, and especially in the playoffs, because you can play, they're playing closer. And guys, and now all of a sudden, Chris Paul, no disrespect, Chris Paul, I heard what happened this today, but you know, you but you can't score with somebody on you. Listen, let me tell you this, E. I've said this 10, 15 years ago. I said Chris Paul's never gonna win a championship. People used to argue me down. Like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, look, you'll see. Can't really hold anybody. And Everybody would make a big thing. Oh, he's six feet and he does what he does. We had a lot of guys who were six feet and was great and could score a lot of buckets and hand out a lot of assists. He's not the first, and I doubt if he would be the last. No. And that the politics, the politics yeah. of the game makes him that, you know? Right. And there's so many plays, like you said, it was so much better. I mean, um, I was um, Rod Strickland was, to me, so much better than him. Never just, made an all-star no. team. Yeah. We talked about that. Chris Paul couldn't hold his jock strap at all. At all. So, you know, look, I I I I saw on, on Sports Center uh Stephen A. Smith, who I'm not too fond of, uh like stick up for him and who was the other guy, uh, the defensive guy from uh, that played for Minnesota? What's his name? Yeah, yeah, I know you're talking about. I forgot his name. Yeah, um, but he went all in on Chris Paul. You know, they 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 go at it. You know, uh, and I want to do him justice to say his name. What's his name? Um, man, oh man, hold on, because I I don't want to disrespect this guy. I I like him a lot, and I want to show him some uh some love. Hold on, I'll tell you right now. Patrick Beverly. Right, yeah. Pat and, and, Beverly. And, it's ridiculous, Pat Beverly. But, and what he said was the truth, and people yeah. don't want to hear that. No. Nope. That's fine. You know, but there's a lot of guys in the NBA that that's the case. There's a lot of guys in college that that's the case. A lot of guys in high school. If you play in a conference somewhere in, in this country in high school and you know that team, you know there's some guys on that team that are probably looked upon as, like, number one player in the state or whatever, and he's not that good. No, nope. and, he, and he'll fizzle out later on in his career, but they, you know, brandished him as the best player, and he's not capable. And there's a lot of guys like that. I've had this. My feelings about Chris Paul is not as strong as yours, but Harden and him are in that. They're in that cloth where these guys are not going to win championships. No, I said, I said him, I said Harden, and I, I said Melo as well. Those are the three guys. And I love Melo's game. No, George. But I don't think it would transition to a championship. George. George, too. Paul George. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not yeah. going to get one. And, and 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 neither is Westbrook, probably. Because no. they, but, they, but and those are guys, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, how how Greer never got a championship. You know, Lou Hudson never got a championship. John Barkley never got one either. Yeah. And so that's okay. But it's just, but but we leave that alone. And you talk about skill set and the work. You know, you you get you put up good numbers. You, your stats show certain things. But peers have different take. And you know, like Crowder, Crowder, like on on Phoenix, right? Crowder, he's never going to get one because he's always like a bridesmaid type of player. And that, and he never shows up when, when it comes to the playoffs. Like he plays okay, and he's he's that glue guy, but he doesn't show up. Right. You know? And and that happens a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that because everybody's not a superstar, and everybody's not garbage. 
You know, you have a, you have your place. They're there for a reason. They're there yeah, for a reason. That's right. You know, and you know, superstars have to beat non superstars, right? So super non superstars, they're they're competing as well. Nobody talks about them, but they're competing too. I, you know, you can't or I can't. Nobody can be a high school all American unless you beat somebody and show that you are you're better than somebody else. And so those people have a place in this process. Because they, they could, very, and, and especially back in that day, you could very easily have gotten taken out by another player because he's as hungry as you are. Yeah. You know, so, you know, so that, so that the guys that don't make it, they're part of the conversation as well. You know, they're yeah. our peers, you know. And, um, you know, I mean, the way we look at the game is a little bit different than the way fans look at it, though, you know, because they don't we're, see we're, what we we're see. Ball players and we're yeah. the fanatics, ball yeah. fans, as they call them. You know, and they don't see it. No, no. Well, we want to get into the roughest part of the show, and that's the top five, top five, top five, top five. All right? And I know you've been watching the show, so I mixed them up a little bit, all right? Um, top five tournaments you played in coming up. Brief what, number one. Number one by far. Um... The high school rucker. Yeah. And that's and that's because it encompassed like the Bronx and Manhattan players. Um a tournament not talked about a lot. The Whitney M. Young. Mm. Whitney M. Young. Where that, was that played out of? That was like a hundred and thirty-fifth. So that's probably the old boys of yes, that's the Whitney Young probably turned to the old boys of yesteryear. Right. And yes. and but that tournament, holy smokes! Because Riverside had we had a team in there, mm -hmm. had multiple teams in there. But then you, had, but we had, everybody else had teams. Chicks All Stars. Um, um, was that there was there's a Linux um, Linux Ave. There was a team from Linux Ave. Excuse me, I think. Um, but they were menacing. I mean, there were so many good teams, and and plus you had the the talent from Billy Goodman, um, Dave Crosby. You know, Fat Daddy, Sadler, Billy Riza, you know, um, Thomas Ridley. You know, like you knew when you were, when you came to play there, like everybody from New, from Harlem, they were there. And it was like, it was just great. You know, Angel Cruz, playing against Angel Cruz, man. I heard, I heard of him. I heard of him. Yeah, well. man. Oh, man. Angel Cruz, man. I mean, there were so many really good players out there that um, that tournament was. So that would be three, right? I mentioned mm -hmm. three. three. Yeah. Soul in the hole, definitely four. Soul in the hole Woo! is definitely there. And, and it's weird because I only play, and this is really crazy. I only played, like, I think in three games in Soul in the hole ever my whole career. And the first time it was in LI, well, I was at LIU. And I was passing by, heading somewhere, and I stopped by. And Earl Fuller was playing, and they didn't have enough guys. And so, but I had on long sweats, and, you know, it was like, you know, I was going to check somebody out, girl out. And um, so Rudy Johnson was there, so you know, get take my shorts. So we swapped out, and I played. It didn't start in the game. I must have 40. I'm serious. I, I'm serious. The first half, I made my first 11 shots in the first half. And, and like five of them were threes. And it was like, and after that, I didn't play like until like a year later, two more games in there. But I, cause I never, I never would play cause I'm always playing. I was playing uptown. Right. You know? So, um, so those are, those are the, my four. The fifth one is hard because I would maybe throw maybe the beach out there, but that wasn't uh, it, it, but the beach tournament changed. So yeah, yeah. The beginning part of it was wicked and great because that's when Fly and then were playing and it was great. It got watered down later on. So they kind of like were on the cuff. A place like Tillery wasn't that tough to me, but it was okay. And I won a championship at Tillery. Um, I never played at um, Lafayette Gardens. Never played there at all. Yeah, Selvin Smith tournament. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. Tough and that's funny because yeah. I knew Selwyn Smith. I knew him. Like, it was like a, a mentor of mine, like an old, one of the older guys. Mm -hmm. So um, so those are so those are the four. And I probably the fifth one would probably be citywide. 
Okay. Because I played citywide in Brooklyn and I played citywide in Manhattan with George and Gill. And um that that the the the, the talent was always there. And 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 people and and they and these were hard, gritty guys that played. There was no soft teams in nah, Citywide. Nah, nah. Citywide you know? was one of, yeah. it, it was good when I was playing. So yeah. right. because you didn't want to because a weak team didn't want to go and play in there because it was like a waste, it was waste of their time and money to get their asses kicked all the time. So it was like a waste. So those were the top five could gotcha, be that. And gotcha. citywide being Brooklyn and the Manhattan one. So all right. Top five players you played with. With or against? We going with first. Um, Albert King, Rodney McRae, Curtis Redding. Ooh. I never got a chance to play with Rolando, but he would be on my list if I if I did. Um. So it's an Albert Kurt. Um, it had to be a guard. Oh man, probably Earl Fuller. He's gonna say that. That's a good one. Definitely. Yeah, Earl. We got and yeah, Earl. So that's four, right? Yeah, that's four. And um, my best friend Les Miller. Because he's a beast, man. And not a lot of people didn't know that, but he was a beast. And they found out he was a beast after college, mm. you know, um, like playing in the, you know, playing with Marty's crew and playing uptown. And that's, they were like, they figured out, they said, we need this guy to play with us because he's a beast. So those are the top five I played with. Yeah. Now the top five you played against? <sighs> Vinny Johnson. Ooh, tough. Tough. Um, ooh. Wow, this that, this is hard. Oh man. Yeah, Vinny is definitely on that list. Bernard. Sorry, yeah. I almost forgot him. Bernard, Bernard King. King, as yeah. you say. Yes. Yeah. Bernard would be number one. Okay. Would, okay. Yeah, yeah, Bernard would be number one. Vinny. Um George Johnson from New Utrecht, mm. without a tough, doubt. Tough, he tough. was, yeah, because he was a man. Um, mm. Maybe Perry Moss, uh, Northwestern, okay, Northeastern, okay. Northeastern, okay. same place that um, that Reggie Lewis went, Northeastern, Perry Moss, yeah, <laughs> and um. Gus, Gus Williams. Gus Williams. Yeah. Gus Williams. Play God, against him. And, and Gus is still play, around, right? Is Gus still yeah, around? Yeah, yeah. He's sick. I think he had a stroke. Um, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, but Who he's still around. Gus? Yeah. I um play against him in City College, man. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a hard, that was hard. <laughs> that was, that was hard to do. And a lot of it was fear because he was a pro. But that was hard, and, and he could we, and, shoot that thing. Yeah, and and and, and yeah, mid range because he because he there was no threes, but he would right. mid range you. Like, put a ball on the floor and then pull, and we don't, and we got into a fight, man, when we played, man. Yeah, I scratched his face because you know you know how you come down, right, right, right. And I caught him in the corner and I saw the ball and I reached down and I got him in his face, and all hell broke loose, man. <laughs> But it wasn't intentional, but you know, but just the response, you know. That's right. But um, but he was it was hard to hold that guy, man, because he was too smart for me. He's too smart for me. Mm. You know, his intelligence of the game, it was he like he played the game easy. And you, I mean he was smooth. And I was I was not ready for that. <laughs> wasn't ready for that, you know, and that's straight up honest, man. He was a pro and I was not. Wow. You know, well, see what you're gonna do with this one right here. <laughs> Top five New York City ballers in New York City history. <sighs> Top five, and you can only name five. No honorable mentions. No six man. Ben, um, Bernard. <laughs> 
I might say Bernhard's number one, two, three, four, five. But um, no, but Bernhard, um, world. World be free, yes. Another guy I'm trying to get in the show. Yeah, world. I mean, and, and, and when I say that extremely respectfully about him because of who, like, the kind of person he is as well. It's like so cool that it's it's it's, it's unbelievable, but it's it's but it's believable. But he's just a cool person. First man. of all, you have to be cool to name you to rename yourself Earl. <coughs> yeah, be free, right? Like yeah, it's- exactly because everybody because everybody accepted it. So you're right, exactly. You know, so he would be number him. Burn on him. Um, Chris Mullen. Mm. Chris Mullen. I mean, and 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 I, I I had a taste of him and playing with him, practicing with him. Chris was was legit. And um, I know Chris is cool enough to come on this show. I know Chris. Chris, you're cool enough to come on this show. Yeah, you know, and um, but yeah, he, he was definitely legit. Um, and and that's you know, um, enough said about that. Um, wow. I think number four would be Vinnie Johnson to me. Mm. And a lot of people, in my my opinion, no one knew just how powerful he was. He's not the guy, the guy that I knew was not the guy on the Pistons. Right. The guy I knew, you know, stuck somebody like about eight inches away from the top of the backboard when we played FBR. And it was like, I mean, it was just ridiculous. But he was, he was like an unstoppable player. And he, and and the best was yet to come, right? Because he got better, you know. He kept working, he kept working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got better, you know. And plus the people he was around. So those are my, those four. The fifth guy. I'm going. I've never played against him. This has to be Fly Williams. I heard he was such a beast. I heard one time, is this true? He scored 55 at the half and then switched uniforms and played on the other team and scored 45. Yeah. And this, and and I have another story that I saw him play in St. John's Rec. He comes into it's like 90 degrees outside. He comes into the gym with a mink coat on, white with like black on it, like that, like, like where a dog's coat would look, you know, with a little bit of black here and there. Girl on his arm. He went nuts on the court. And like he wasn't like a high rising guy or like like skills, like jump shot, put a ball on the floor, or you know, like you know, layups, down on the floaters. Like he does like a complement of all kind of arsenals that he has. Mm. Game is over. He takes the you know the referee puts the ball on the scores table, takes the ball and leaves. Puts the mink court, takes a ball and leaves. And I was like 14 years old. Right. I had never seen nothing like that before. I'm like, I, I mean, I just couldn't understand that. But I and but the guys he was playing against, and it was like um, I think it was like, like um Brooklyn against like Philadelphia or something like that. So it was like him and Jocko and um Larry Fogel. I mean, it's like the older guys, right? Right, right. But he was like Al Green. And a lot of people don't know who Al Green is. Like, Google that name. Play that Maine. I'm telling you. This was, oh, my gosh. He was an un- incredible basketball player, man. You know? Wow. Yeah, but those are my top five, man. Okay. You know, definitely flies <laughs> on that list without a doubt, you know? Wow. You know, but and if I were to put somebody at number one, uh, I, I I couldn't do it. So I, I'm not even gonna go there. No, no, no. That, that five, five that five is, is good enough. If you had to do it all over again, what would you change? Um, I would have went to class. That's the next that, that would have made the sole difference. And I should have been smart enough to know no matter what happens, like I, in hindsight, no matter what happens go to class and do what you have to do. Um, I'm not, of course, and for me, I was not that impressed with academics. Like it wasn't like a problem for me. So 
I mean, I just would have benefited even more so. I think I'm a pretty sharp person, you know, critical thinker, blah, 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 blah. But um, I think it would have propelled me a little further. Um, as far as basketball, and, that, that, and that's just like regular life stuff. That's what right. I should have done. Basketball related? I should have, I should have went back. I, I should have went to Murray State. That's what I should have done. I should have went. I should have just not. I should have shrugged it off. Worry about the Ku Klux Klan and all that stuff, and went you know to school at. And I don't. I don't have any you know bad feelings about it. But that's if I had to do it over again, I would have stayed there, you know, because um, they really wanted me like really bad, and I was playing well. Um, I was playing real well, you know. So I mean, that that, that and I think that they, that was the Ohio Valley Conference OVC. Yeah. yeah. And um, that would have been a perfect situation for me because they would give me an opportunity to show my skill sets, like at a um, like it was like a, a a major college instead of mid major, you know. So that's that's what I would have done differently. We went stayed at um, in Kentucky and went to Murray State, you know. Gotcha. And, but the funny thing is, because I had such success that the other schools were looking at us as well, looking at me or at the school because we were like 27 and three or whatever, you know, so Louisville started looking at us, you know, Ohio, that's because, you know, where we're located at. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, well, I should, I, staying there would have been great. You know, my might have ran up against uh, Orlando a couple of times, maybe. That's right, that's right. <laughs> And I heard that he almost went to Midwood High School, I heard. Yeah, and, and opted out to go to Grady. Yeah. 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 Because I imagine if he and I had to play together. Oh, man. man. That would have been something else. That would have definitely been dynamic. Yeah. Well, who who would you like to, to nominate to be on the show? Um, it, does it have to be one person or I throw three names Dude, at you? Look, once you come on the show, you can nominate as many people as you want. Especially if you're in contact with them, that makes it a lot easier. Right. This way, you can speak to them and let them know what's, what right. we got going on. Well, I think, well, there's three guys. And the first one would be my best friend, Les Miller. Gotcha. And the reason being is because he, I had a, a, a great career at Hartwick, you know, top you know, school in Division II, 1,000 point score as a you know, sophomore and junior, went overseas and played, great career. Um, definitely Leslie Miller. Um, the uh, two other guys, and I know you know them, the Canarsie guys, Jesse Massey and Kurt Reddy. Those are two my, my uh, two other my homeboys. Jesse and I talk like weekly, and um, Jesse and I are real cool. And so, and same with Kurt. But those two guys, um, they, I, they, their stories of how what things were like at Canarsie, playing with Coach Reiner. They have great stories um, about their careers and how things went. Jesse and I, like we talk about it all the time. And um, those three guys, that their stories need to be told because they were, you know, the echelon of Brooklyn basketball during that era of New York City basketball. You know, um, and of all the players that I've ever played against in my entire life, the one person that I I never played against him that I would be nervous about is Kurt Redding. Now, was, both of them still in Brooklyn or, or on the New York yeah, area? Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. So, this is what I would like to do, especially for the Canarsie guys. Um, we have a, a studio, I'm not going to name the location, only we give it out to the people who show up. Uh, I'm not going to name it publicly, but we have a new studio that we're working out of. Um, and, and I want to start to bring guys in and, and, you know, have that personal conversation with them live in the studio and, and just utilize uh, the space while we have it. Right. Um, and and want to do that. So we could definitely set it up. And you just let me know, and then we'll put it all together. Sure. Yeah. Because those guys definitely, um, like I said, echelon players of the era. And um, like I said, Kurt was the only guy that I know that I was going to give me a hard time because it's like his strength and his athleticism. Like if I, if I had to play against Kurt, I would be worried, <laughs> you know, but we always played together on the same team together. Right. So, um, so I knew his worth, 
you know, and um, he was the premier, one of the premier players of that era, in my opinion. That's just my opinion, though. You know. No, nah, listen. Yeah. You you you've been such a wealth of knowledge, um, and even watching uh, your story on Ball Side Middle, uh, I was eager to get a chance to talk to you and, and you know get the whole thing, the entirety. Uh, and and my version of it, because you know, uh, Coach Booth has his salute to Craig and what he's doing. Um, but I definitely wanted to try to you know uh, get you on and definitely make this happen. So I appreciate you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. you for all the memories and, and all the you know the things that you did on the court and off the court to bring joy to people, um, helping the youth afterwards and and staying around long enough for us to have this conversation, man. I appreciate you, man, and God bless you, man. And, and keep yeah, I appreciate strong. that. And I'm going to be calling you because there's some, there's some articles that I, I definitely need. And and you said that's your specialty. You know, they have they have a, a, a article about the Brevo Coliseum. It was 1977 in the Daily News. Bill Travis did it. I found it. It's on my page, but I have to scroll all the way down and all the 4,000 posts that I posted. But I can't find it again. Like what I have I them. <laughs> I have them all. I've got five million. I got five million articles. <laughs> five million. I'm serious. Five million listen, articles. Listen, bro. Please, please. I would love to. You know, of course, cap the the whole capsule New York City basketball and 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 just showcase those people that people kind of forgot about. Yeah, you know, yeah. And God's are still talking about you to this day. This is why I called you again because, you know, God's coming to show, talk about you, or there's a few guys who leave comments on my YouTube page. I'm um, soon to my guy, Mike, uh, and a few others. I can't remember your name, but my guy, Mike from Queens, he stands out because his commentary is amazing. And then he fills me in on information that I even know about. So I'm checking these names like, wow, I got to get him on the show. Wow, is he still alive? Like this guy, he just brings it out. And I know when he watches your video, he's going to chime in and speak about people who you was told about and expand the story even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, salute to Mike, man. Yeah. And, I and, and, this, and, this, and this, yeah, and there's a lot. There's a, like uh, we said in the beginning, there's a lot of stories everybody's got a story and a lot of them have value to them, you know, and um, between that and, you know, the information, like you said, the articles and everything, there's a lot of content and stuff that talks about our histories, whereas there were no cameras. Right. You know, so um, it's got to be articles and, you know, word of mouth. And um, as long as we're alive, I take that experience to everyone. And now, and you do as well, and you're documenting it. So, um, now we have proof of those stories because you're documenting stuff about everyone's story. Because when I, you know, look, when I was coming up, um, it, it was, I was always told by my elders that, you know, if we want our history told right, we have to tell it ourselves. Because if somebody else tell it, it's not going to be the way that it really was. Yeah. And plus you got to tell the truth. Yes. You know, and that's what happened with Craig Booth. Craig came to me because he came to everybody telling me he's starting, he's getting ready to do this project. And I came back to him like kind of like four or five days later. I said, said, not only, you know, do I support what you're doing, because he's my friend anyway, but I said, you know, I can help. You know, I said, because I can be that voice on your shoulder to say, you know, no, yes, or you know, like you know, that that angel and that devil on your shoulder to say, because you got to tell a story right. Because you're right. talking about my era that I played in, and I can't let you lie. But Craig's not going to. But I'm just saying I got to make sure that he, like, I'm there to, you know, to keep and make sure he does it right. And he don't even really need me because that's his intent in the first place. So that makes it like real easy that I'm just supportive of that. Um, but then when the articles popped in, and that became like that's that's a monster, you know, because that added to anyone's commentary because here's proof. It's, that's, that's, it's, it's valid, right? There. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I said to you about the guy, the guy who said, with Tom Tchaikovsky, who said about um, coming to New York, like that solidifies, you know, what how the recruiting process was in America in the 70s. 
They yeah. wanted to see New York basketball players because we were highly skilled. And that went on for a long time. And, and, and that article proves that. And, you know, and, and plus everybody's accolades, because people come back to me, it's like, hey, I need some articles. Now my son believes I used to play because he sees articles. And, and that's what I'm, I'm bringing joy to my peers by saying, here's, here's some articles, show your family. You know, because you know those pit, you know those articles. They're yellow about now. You know what I'm saying? Poof. Listen, you know, turn colors. <laughs> you don't got to tell me. I I still have uh my articles. Well, they they're mines to this day, and I just try to keep them wrapped up. And yeah, look at the yellow. Just already seeping in. Yeah, but it said, but but see my but the articles that I have, they're clean. And you've seen them, and they're clean, man. They're Yo, look, clean. this is why I need to connect with you. Because, look, my my Street and Smith been around so long, the covers came off. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? The Street and Smith basketball, for those of you that don't know. And it's only from 1986 to 1987. And, yeah. by the way, I, I was uh, honorable mention as well. So, that you know, that when I saw that, I was just like, wow, you know, cut from the same cloth. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and it's funny because Rolando Blackman sent me a message and he said, seeing your name on there made him work harder. That's what he told me, you know, because he wanted to get his name on the list, That's you right. know. And, um, he's but it's such weird. A good guy. He, yeah, he, man, he's. He gave you know, me one of my first, he was the first pro that I interviewed early on in, in season one. Yeah, and he, and, he, and, he, and, and he speaks the truth of putting in the effort, working hard paying attention information, things they said, like, you know, sit up, you know, don't, don't slouch, you know, like re represent yourself, you know, and, and we all have those skill sets. We all know better, you know, um, but they, Rolando's a good guy, man. And that's, you know, and, and he's going to speak the truth from being a pro and that, and, and the history of us needs that, you know, that, that, cause that balances the us not guys that didn't become pros Having a pro interviewing a pro balances out the stories that you that you have, you know. So a burn on. Well, even or let's, let's look at this guy right here. Not to cut you off, the guy I'm interviewing now, Mel Sean Scott. I think he only really played one full year, two full years of high school basketball. He didn't really finish out in college, but what he did in street ball kind of solidified him. And yeah. you know, he has some defining moments in his life where he kind of changed his life for how it was when he was younger to bounce it back as an adult, right? So you got to have all of those stories intertwined. It just can't yeah. be the quote unquote stars because after a while it, people start telling the same stories. Yeah, because, and plus we turn out to be good men. I mean, yes. guys yes. doing different things. You know, um, I, don't, I, I don't know any basketball players from my era that are, in the, that are rapists, killers, murderers, bank robbers. Yeah. Right. You know, that got arrested, you know, other than fly situation. Right. I didn't hear anything about anybody doing anything negative, but you can't, you know, you you ask, you know, somebody else and they'll say, oh, those guys ain't nothing but jocks. No, we're grown men who have had families, raised our kids, are graduates and married and their grandkids. And, you know, and, you know, it's like we're we're valued people. So, yes, yes. Um, and even when we make mistakes, playing ball or doing things, we find our way. Because we're not everybody's perfect. We're all mature, immature at a certain point in time, but when it kicks in and you become mature and you start living the, the, the adult life and you adjust to adult ways of things like home ownership and property ownership and investments and things of that nature, then you know that you you take on that role. So you're no longer a kid, you're an adult now. And, and we've all made those transitions. Like how many guys that are ball players, like great men, are, um, correction officers, police officers, Wall Street analysts, you know, doctors working in the hospitals, working city jobs, and are retired now. You know, we're good men and women. It's women that have been doing the same thing. So, um, so these stories that you're, you know, using and 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 providing for everyone, um, it shows nothing but positivity. So somebody else has a, another opinion, quite honestly, they can kiss my ass because I see what you're doing. That's plain thank and simple. You, you. It's thank just you. plain and simple, you know? And, you know, 
and, and that's just really the long and the short of it, you know, and, 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 and everybody knows that I guarantee you, everyone knows what you're doing. They know why you're doing it and how it's working out. And um, we're all respectful to that because we're seeing our peers and younger people and seeing how, because I know where the bodies are buried in the seventies, but I don't know about the two thousands. Right. Who was the good players then, but you're bringing all of that to light because you're not segregating it to the, the, that, that my past, you're, you're, you're covering the whole stream of years, you know? So um, that's information that people need to see, you know? Yeah. I want to give a shout out to uh, who just my God, Joe Jackson. What up, Joe? Uh, Paul Scurry, and who's that? <laughs> Ramulo Mart- Mar- uh, Martinez. Salute! Thank you for yeah. joining in. Yeah, so Paul. Joe. Joe, what's up, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they all watch you right now, man, and probably many more. Probably not even commenting. Want to salute everybody who joined us. But I, again, I want to thank you, Eric. This is not going. I, I want to try to get you on again. Um, maybe do a, a multiple Zoom. Uh, and I think I, I'll have another platform. I'll probably do uh, another platform I won't mention right now. Sure, That's okay. what I'm working on. Because when I, when I shoot this, I'm not able to put my logos up and the things that I need to put up. But we're going to work on that. But I'm going to bring okay. you on again. And and I, I just we want to just have a discussion and just have multiple different uh, opinions about basketball and, and how things are moving now. Cause I know you're a great mind and someone, you know, that, that knows a lot about the game. Yeah. I appreciate that. All right. Yeah, definitely, bro. Just let me know. I'll be there. No, no. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I want to say thank you. Um, you're definitely a legend. Um, you're never going to be forgotten. And brother, again, blessings, blessings to your wife and your family and and just keep kicking brother. And we're going to be here for you. Will do. I'm going to try my best. I promise you that. <laughs> yes, yes. Please. All right. All right. Okay, bro. All right. Take care. You too, man. All right. All right, people. Listen, you know how we do. We just try to be authentic, be our best selves. But knowing all the things that Eric Short had against him, could have quit early. Even though some would say in the medical fields he should have. But if he never took that chance to push himself and his body to the limits, with some caution, we wouldn't have all the great memories we have of him. For you youngsters out there, we're going to have decisions to make. Make sure you make the ones that's best for you. Okay? And when it's all said and done, great man, provider for his family, and done a lot for the youth. So you want to ask yourself, what are you doing with your life? How many people are you touching? How many people are you impacting? That's what it's all about. And he has impact us all. Knowing that he became the logo for the Brevo Sports Foundation, somewhere where I grew up, and somewhere now where I'm trying to repeat with you know my Brevo uh, committee that we're all putting us down together, and we're going to call it the Brevo Sports Foundation again try to duplicate what they did early on with Mr. Troutman. So with saying that, I want to thank my guest, Brooklyn legend, Midwood legend, LIU great, Eric Short for stopping by and telling us an amazing story. Because that's one amazing story. Even with all that he got going on right now, you can never tell. Never frown, never complain. He just keeps kicking. We love you, E, and appreciate you. Well, it's that time. I'm about to get out of here. I am your host, Glenn Pooh Harding. And you've been watching Basketball Heads Live. 
the official home for New York City basketball. You know what we always say. Peace.